Welcome. Welcome to our virtual workshop this morning. Uh, this is Global Water Futures workshop on agricultural considerations for the Canada Water Agency. Um, I am Stephanie Merrill and I am a knowledge mobilization specialist based at the University of Saskatchewan. I work for the Global Water Futures program. Uh, Nancy, who you also heard in the background, is my uh, co-pilot here today. Uh, she is a knowledge mobilization specialist uh, for the program based at the University of Waterloo. And we are uh, your hosts for today's event. I just first wanted to start by acknowledging that we're all participating from across the country and uh, from many traditional territories of the First Peoples uh, of this country. Uh, I'm in Saskatoon. I'm on Treaty 6, which is traditional territory of the Cree and homeland of the Métis. Please just take a moment on your own to acknowledge the territory where you're sitting today uh, and give some appreciation for providing the space, the virtual space and your physical space uh, for us today and uh, for providing a, a positive discussion. Today's event is being convened by the Global Water Futures Program and it's a continuation of our work through a partnership called Water Security for Canadians uh, with the Forum for Leadership on Water, the Polis Institute at the University of Victoria, the Center for Indigenous Environmental Resources, the United Nations University Institute for Health and Environment, and Massey College. Global Water Futures is the world's largest university-led water research program, and it's a partnership between the University of Saskatchewan, McMaster, University of Waterloo, and Wilfrid Laurier. We're at the halfway mark of a seven-year program, and our goals are to advance the science needed to better forecast, prepare, and manage water futures in the, in the uh, face of dramatically increasing risks from climate change. Um, working with partners and uh, practitioners, government agencies, and community guides us and enables us to connect our science to evidence in water programs, decision-making, and policy advancements. Improving water management in Canada is fundamentally the aim of this program and why we wanted to continue this discussion today. So thank you so much for joining us. Today's workshop is meant to build on a very successful national water policy panel that we hosted in mid-May. At that event, uh, we had about 750 people registered uh, and today more than 400. So thanks for joining. Uh, and wanting to dig a little bit deeper uh, into the priority issue of agriculture. The development of the Canada Water Agency is co-led by the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. And agriculture is a very large focus of the research within the Global Water Futures Program. So uh, there was some technical, um, yeah, I'll go back actually. So, so just some technical housekeepings. Um, we are uh, attempting to do simultaneous translation again today, um, and it seems to be working well. So uh, if any of you are interested in uh, switching to the French channel, there is um, a, a kind of a globe icon in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom, and you have the option of clicking over to a French channel where you, where you will hear our simultaneous translators. Um, everybody's been muted um, and we, we please ask you to stay muted and keep your videos off it, unless you are a, a speaker or a panelist later in the agenda and then please switch your cameras on to participate. Uh, the speaker view is the best for, for watching, um, watching the presentations and the share screen at the same time. It doesn't clutter up your screen. Um, we'll use the chat box to collect uh, questions and comments for uh, the question and answer period after the, the moderated panel with our Global Water Futures researchers. But feel free to be uh, adding those questions al along the way and Nancy and myself will be uh, collecting those and, and, uh, and choosing the best uh, questions to, to send to our researchers. Um, and yes, all of the presentations, the entire event will be recorded uh, and available to everybody who's here and who um, were not able to attend. And I will circulate all of that material after the event. Uh, so here's today's agenda. Um, as you hopefully uh, know, it's a two part um, event today and we'll be together for this first session for 90 minutes. 
we'll break for an hour, give you a chance to have a little lunch, stretch your legs, uh, and then come back for another 90 minute session. Um, you will use the same meeting link to join the second session as you joined this morning. So uh, just a quick overview of the format this morning, the first session we're gonna focus on some global water future science advancements uh, made on agriculture and water related issues and, um, uh, and, and have time for a question answer period with all of you. Part two will transition us into a discussion on agriculture's water science to policy. And Dr. John Pomeroy, our director of the Global Water Futures Program, will engage uh, the Honorable Ralph Woodale in an interview about his vision for water governance and management in Canada based on his vast experience. Then we'll hear from a, leader, a panel of leaders in water management and programming. Um, and uh, hopefully that will get the juices flowing for a lively discussion in our breakout sessions. Uh, and I'll give more details about how that will work um, in, in, uh, in part two. Then we'll convene for some, some follow, uh, some wrap up, some follow up thoughts and uh, close out for the day. So with all of that introduction, um, I will introduce our first two speakers. So Dr. John Pomeroy and Maren McRae, they are going to introduce the Global Water Future Program and its aims and give an overview of the agricultural and water related research being conducted with, by numerous scientists within the Global Water Futures um, Program across many institutions. So John, I'll get you to share your screen and I'll uh, give you a quick introduction. So Dr. John Pomeroy holds the Canada Research Chair in Water Resources and Climate Change uh, and is a distinguished professor at the University of Saskatchewan where he directs the Global Water Futures Program. His research focuses on developing better understanding, prediction and management of water in Canada's cold regions and around the world. Right. Are you having trouble sharing your screen? Yes. I think it's because you are a co-host. All right. There Can we are. Can you do it now that I've unshared mine? Yes, I think we we have it. Do you have it? Uh, do you have the main display? Stephanie, do we have it on the main screen? Uh, I don't see it. No. Okay. Very strange here. Can we? Want to try again, John? Yeah. Okay. Starting now. And there we go. Here we are. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Stephanie, and. Um, uh, we, uh, by the way, we are trying to bring in uh, some extra people. We know there's a few trapped outside, so hopefully we'll have that sorted out. I, I want to thank uh, Stephanie and Nancy for organizing this uh, tremendous event. It is part of a, a group of regional science tours and uh, knowledge mobilization events from Global Water Futures as we uh, reach our halfway mark uh, through the program. And so I'm going to talk a bit about uh, water and agriculture and how this might relate to the proposed Canada Water Agency. So uh, one thing that is foremost in our minds in the Global Water Futures Program is that uh, water is the basis for all life on our planet and, and, our, and human activity and it, uh, water is a, a fundamental part of the climate system, the earth system which regulates our climate. And so uh, when we talk about climate change and water, they're fully intertwined, but then water is what connects much of climate uh, to our, our food, to our energy, uh, to our communities, to our health, uh, many other things. The, um, you'll notice some artwork in this, and this is from an artist based in the UK, Gennady Ivanov, who's been uh, painting uh, scenes for Global Water Futures over the last uh, year and a half. Um, from different parts of Canada, trying to convey the science and communicate the science in a different way. So what, where are we with water in Canada at this point? 
uh, Canada is perceived as a water rich country, but we're not a water secure country. Uh, much of our water resources are flowing to the north, our, whilst Canadians and our activities are in the south. And many parts of Canada are in the subhumid to semi arid regions where uh, perennial water shortages are part of life. The other aspects of water, though, are also lead to insecurity, and that is flooding and contamination of water supplies. Uh, since the turn of the century, we've had nearing on $30 billion, I'm sure we're past $30 billion now, uh, in uh, damages from flood, droughts, and fires. And these extreme events uh, carry on across our agricultural regions and downstream of our agricultural regions across the country. Uh, and are uh, some of the uh, most horrific events one can, can live through. Uh, and now that we have the global pandemic from COVID-19, we're finding the complexities of evacuations uh, from floods or fires uh, when we also have to deal with the virus. Much of this is tied into climate change. Canada is warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. Um, our cold regions hydrology is, is warming, our, our permafrost is thawing, our glaciers, the snow are melting, the uh, lake ice is breaking up, and, and uh, this changes uh, conditions for our agricultural fields fundamentally as the uh, uh, soils warm up, crop possibilities change, and water supply for crops changes. As we look to the future, uh, the uh, warming over Canada is ubiquitous, and if we were able to stabilize greenhouse gases by the end of the century, we would still be looking over much of the agricultural region of Canada of warming um, in excess of two degrees, uh, two to four. If we follow on our current path, which is not to control greenhouse gas emissions, uh, then we can look at uh, warming uh, from five to seven degrees over many of the agricultural regions of Canada. It makes agriculture hard to envision uh, with that much warming, uh, other than it would be very, very different. Uh, and the, the variability in this is important as well. A, a sequence of droughts and uh, cold periods and unseasonal weather uh, also creates difficulty. Remember uh, last year in the, was an average year for temperature and precipitation in Saskatchewan, but it included one of the worst droughts in history in the first half of the year and one of the worst wet periods in history in the second half of the year. As a result, um, uh, farm production was down to 1980 levels across the province. So be careful of these average conditions. They, uh, the extremes are what will cause problems. And there's a general increase in precipitation uh, predicted across the country uh, for climate models. Uh, uh, greater increases in precip if we don't control greenhouse gases um, and, and their emissions. Uh, but the, uh, uh, you know, this is in the order of 10 to 20 percent over the, much of the agricultural region. Uh, a bit less if we stabilize the fluxes. But it's how that precipitation comes. Again, uh, wet falls and dry springs are not very good, and neither are having your uh, uh, two months or three months of precipitation in a few hours, um, such as has happened recently, including uh, Calgary just uh, uh, just uh, last week. So the, uh, there's uh, lots of issues with how that precipitation comes that can make agricultural better, or it can make agriculture unviable, depending on, on its uh, patterns and the extremes in this. So this is some of the background to the Global Water Futures Program, which was formed in 2016 through a grant from the Canada First Research Excellence Fund. It's a partnership of the University of Saskatchewan, Waterloo, McMaster, and Laurier, with uh, 15 other universities across Canada uh, contributing uh, to the program through uh, their expertise. And so it's truly a national research program. It's the largest water research program in the world and, uh, and certainly the, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the largest run by a university consortium. What are the missions of Global Water Future? Uh, three aspects to it, primarily. Uh, one is to improve disaster warning. Uh, the increase in extreme events uh, really uh, shows that we have to find better ways to predict the occurrence of these events in the distant future uh, decades to century, but also over short periods of uh, days to weeks uh, to uh, better uh, mitigate uh, some of the impacts. Uh, better forecasting leads to uh, smaller implications, better planning. Uh, we want to be able to predict water futures, the future water supplies. We want to be able to inform adaptation to climate change and managing risk, risk management, which of course that's what farming is all about. 
So where is Global Water Futures today? Um, we have 39 projects funded and running across the country. We just approved 12 more projects, so take this up over 50, and uh, we have allocated all of our funding from the Canada First Research Excellence Fund. The, uh, we are approaching now 600 uh, researchers, uh, various types, and uh, um, over 160 faculty investigators. So a it's a tremendously large program. It ties into international projects like the World Meteorological Organization, UNESCO, Future Earth, the World Climate Research Program. And uh, what's critical for supporting it is the amount of uh, in-kind and uh, cash contributions to it from its users. It's really a, a transdisciplinary project and uh, many of the projects are led by user questions and have direct user engagement, which makes them very powerful. Now, of those 39 projects, how many relate to agriculture? Well, over half. Um, we, uh, in fact, are a very agricultural program, and uh, these are the projects uh, that have some agricultural component to them. Some, like agricultural water futures or prairie drainage governance, is very clear. Um, others, uh, less clear, uh, but when we look at uh, crowdsourcing or prairie water or algae blooms or uh, integrated modeling or wetland evaporation or indigenous water quality tools, these all have agricultural implications to them. Lake futures dealing with the Great Lakes, uh, eDNA from Next Generation Solutions, all these tie into the agricultural uh, system in some way. So uh, if you want to learn in depth about these projects, go to the Global Water Futures website and you can find links under the projects, under uh, uh, pillars one, two, or three, to all these here, and you can dive into them. Many of them have uh, full websites that are very descriptive and uh, bring forward lots of information. So it's a, a really fascinating program, and this has got to be one of the largest agricultural research programs led by universities in this sense. So we also have core modeling teams and uh, core computer science teams, knowledge mobilization, and others. Uh, and at the core modeling, there's a uh, prediction strategy, which is done in, in conjunction with the projects, focusing on these river basins across Canada that you see highlighted here. And several of them have substantial agricultural components, the Great Lakes St. Lawrence, the St. John, the uh, Saskatchewan Nelson, uh, the uh, Columbia, the Fraser, uh, primary, other primary ones, uh, bits in the upper reaches of the uh, Mackenzie River Basin as well. So agriculture is a key part of uh, hydrology across our country. And of course, many of us are drinking through groundwater or surface water, agricultural waters, as well as in areas uh, such as the mountains or the, um, uh, uh, some of the uplands in Ontario, uh, source areas for agriculture that provide important water supplies. So here are some results out of the core modeling program, looking at the future of the Saskatchewan River Basin under climate change with uh, current water management rules. So this is accounting for water for irrigation in Alberta and Saskatchewan and uh, accounting for the flows out of the mountains, uh, the contributions off the prairies. And uh, so I call your attention to the South Saskatchewan River at Saskatoon, the stream flows there, because this is showing uh, the stream flows essentially downstream of Gardner Dam. And we can see in green uh, the flows from 1979 to 2010. Uh, with a peak occurring in June and, and July, and then flows dropping off into late summer. As we shift into blue, which is 2025 to 2055, or red, which is 2070 to 2100, we see earlier and earlier flows and also higher peaks. But then also it looks like under the current water management rules in, uh, in Operation Lake Diefenbaker, there would be occasions where the spillway needs to be used and hydroelectricity can't be generated. So we know we'll need to manage water differently in the future with uh, these changing flows. And in this case, the South Saskatchewan River, on average, uh, looks like there'll be more flow coming through, but then also periods when uh, uh, droughts uh, cause uh, serious problems as well. And we see these earlier flows all across the West in these rivers. This can create issues for irrigation, which uh, uh, may wish to use these waters in June uh, but in fact, if we have availability showing up in March and April, that could be problematic in some cases. So uh, we're going to have to manage differently in the future and use our infrastructure very differently to support agriculture where irrigation is a factor. Now, it's also important to know what's going on, on in the agricultural world outside of Canada's borders. And so a new element of Global Water Futures is this Planetary Water Prediction Initiative. 
And this is a model run using a model called SUMA that Martin Clark has uh, developed and uh, running across North America to predict soil moisture. This sort of intelligence on uh, continental soil moisture can be extremely useful for the Canadian agriculture industry uh, to know how crops are doing in the southern U.S. Great Plains and uh, as well as in knowing in detail how our uh, soil moisture conditions are varying across the country. So great to have that in context. Well, wrapping up, uh, what's our future for water? What's our future for agriculture? We have changing climate, we have changing water supply needs for irrigation, crops will be changing, tillage practices are changing, the demand and price for food is set by often international markets which uh, change dramatically in unpredictable ways. Look at the impact of COVID on, uh, on the whole food markets around the world. The environmental needs of waters uh, draining from agricultural lands are uh, critically important. And remember that agricultural lands uh, host the recharge of groundwater, which are the primary water supplies for our farms and small communities in rural areas. Uh, the health of our wetlands and lakes is critically important to Canadians, and that means managing them in a holistic way in the agricultural context. And we have to look at water management and competing uses. So all these would benefit from informed water management based on improvement in measurements, predictions, and mobilization of knowledge to producers and rural water management authorities. So how do we do this? Well, one proposal that's come forward is the Canada Water Agency. It was in uh, the, the speech in the fall uh, from the government, and it's in the minister, uh, letters to the Minister of Agriculture and Minister of Environment. And here are some things in previous discussions that have come up for what a Canada Water Agency might do. One is create a mobilized knowledge needed to, pr to predict and respond to water problems and opportunities. Bring all the water information together. Predict future droughts, floods, water quality, water supply, and provide decision support. The second is to strengthen transboundary water management. Almost all of our agricultural water is shared across provincial or national boundaries or between uh, First Nation uh, territories and other lands. So we want to anticipate, avoid, and resolve disputes. We need to adapt to climate change. We need to better map and uh, reduce the risk of floods, but also map the risk. Uh, we need to look at BMPs and how they might be applied. We have an urgent need to strengthen our reconciliation with Indigenous people. Uh, we can look at revising the Canada Water Act, co-drafting it with First Nations, a consent-based process, and implementing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in federal water law and management. And we can improve our collaborative river basin planning. Uh, water doesn't care about the map of Canada and how we've apportioned it uh, between various units. Water flows uh, through river basins downstream. And so we need to build partnerships to manage water the way it flows. We need to restore river basins, uh, deal with environmental flow regimes, and improve soil and water conservation. So these are just a few things to look at. And I think having a science-led agency like this could really help Canada uh, so that uh, because we're having the uh, challenge of a lifetime, the COVID pandemic is going to be nothing compared to climate change for this century. And so we don't want a future where we can't produce food, uh, where we suffer incessant droughts and we haven't the tools to manage it properly. We need a future where we're managing our water, managing our agriculture sustainably and equitably for all of Canada. Thank you. And uh, we'll go on to Professor McCray who will uh, introduce the agricultural research in this program. Great, Marin, if you can share your slide deck from your end, and I'll introduce you. So Dr. Marin McCray is a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management at the University of Waterloo. Her research interests are in the linkages between hydroclimate climatology, biogeochemical cycling, surface water chemistry under variable climate regimes. Her work is largely focused in agricultural watersheds and wetland ecosystems. Hi, sorry, uh, just a quick check. Do you see my screen? Hello? Yes, we do. You're oh, good. Thanks. Okay, good, thanks. Okay, it's a, a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> so I'd like to give a, a quick overview of the agricultural water science that's being done in the Global Water Futures Program. So, um, 
So our priority is to maintain food security in Canada. We need food, obviously, but agriculture is also a really big part of our economy. And so water supply and use are major components of agriculture, and these are strongly linked to climate. So across Canada, what we produce is to a large extent related to what we can produce. And this is uh, to largely dictated by, by climate, but also landscape factors and cultural influences. But we know that our climate conditions may be changing, which is going to impact what we can produce. And this can have a cascade effect to our food and economic security. So not only is the climate changing, but the agricultural landscape is also changing. Relatively speaking, a small proportion of Canada can actively be farmed, something like 7%. Much of this is, is in the Western Canada, but we do have agriculture, as you can see, we do have agriculture across the Canada. The problem is that many of those areas that can be farmed also coincide with pressures of urban growth and urban expansion. So there, there are those pressures between urban growth and agricultural land. But at the same time, there are areas that we couldn't previously farm that are starting to open up and we can start to introduce agriculture into these regions. So it's really a changing landscape. Um, we're also seeing modifications to how we farm. So the, the images across the bottom of the screen are showing air photos above Ontario. I was uh, able to obtain these air photos from Omafra. So what we can see is that the, the, demo, the way the fields are being cultivated is changing. We no longer have that patchwork small family farm. What we're starting to see is bigger fields, less crop diversity. Um, we're also seeing much more artificial or assisted drainage, be that tile drainage or ditch drainage. And this is all having a tremendous impact on the landscape. So all in all, we as a community are tasked with maintaining food security, but we have a moving target in terms of climate and agricultural land use and management. And so it's really important that we work together as a community to stay ahead of that curve so that we can adapt to these changes as they come. And projects like Global Water Futures and also a Canadian Water Agency can play a, an important role in this work among, uh, along with the other agencies across Canada. So how exactly are climate, water, and agriculture linked? Well, they're linked in terms of both water supply, so water supply for agriculture, but also water supply as a result of agriculture. Certainly downstream communities may rely on this water. In terms of water quality, climate impacts runoff, and along with runoff comes nutrients and other materials which can impact ecosystem health and are their, their use for recreation, but also can have human health risks. Certainly some of our large lakes are definitely under threat. Think of Winnipeg and Lake Erie and these are, are binational issues that have to be dealt with. So if we want to understand how agriculture will respond to climate change, the first place to start is looking at how the Canadian climate is changing. And so the extremes team is exploring this. And what they are finding is that precipitation related extremes are changing. So if we first consider droughts, how will the occurrence, severity, and the evolution of drought change in the future? So the graph on the screen is showing the life cycle of a drought as an example. And in the prairies, they've used an ensemble of regional climate models. And what they've found is that in general, they're projecting that they're going to have more events, more drought events, more severe events. These are going to be longer in duration, and they're going to have lo so longer persistence, but little change in their growth or their retreat. But we're also going to see increases in hailstorms. So they may see increased incidences of hailstorms in some regions. These are going to produce larger hailstones. And as we can see from the photograph on the lower left on the screen, this can be really problematic for crops. We're also seeing increases in heavy rainfall. So they looked at trends in North American one and five day maximum rainfall and they found that we are indeed seeing larger storms in, over North America. And when they used their climate models to explore why this was, there was no other explanation than anthropogenic influences. And so they're really anticipating that this is going to increase in future, which is going to be really important for agriculture when we think about the impacts of those heavy downpours on our fields. So the changes in climate that the extremes team is projecting is really a central aspect throughout the global water futures community as many of us are working with them and these simulations and coupling it to our own work to try to look at how things are going to evolve in future. 
So the agricultural water futures team is looking specifically at how the climate changes in both the prairies and lakes or Great Lakes regions, but how, sorry, how that climate change is going to impact crop growth and water use efficiency. So some of the work is in, on, is in improving crop models, which are really currently needing some development. And um, also they're looking at agriculture specific metrics that are relevant to production. So one example is what you see on the screen on the left. And so we're facing the graph on the left, we're facing warmer temperatures in all seasons. And in the prairies, we're going to see hot days, more hot days, more heat waves. And this is going to be relevant to livestock because it's going to impact their comfort and therefore can introduce stress. But it's also going to impact our crops. And so we're using the, the different climate projections and the crop models to learn if and how different crop types are going to respond to heat and moisture stress. And they're finding that the extreme heat does affect some of our cool season crops and that some warmer season crops may do better in the prairies. Now, in Ontario, in the Grand River watershed, we're not really seeing evidence of moisture stress at this point in time, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to see it in future. And so one of the other um, issues that are being explored in the Agricultural Water Futures Program is can irrigation start to play an increased role in managing some of the moisture stress, particularly in the prairies? So we're also throughout the, our, the agricultural work that's being done in Global Water Futures, we're also looking at how the change in climate is impacting water quality in our large lakes and the occurrences of blooms. So the form bloom team has been looking at the occurrences of algal blooms in some of our large lakes and, and many lakes across Canada. And so this is of course important for the health of these uh, surface water bodies. So what we can see is that bloom risk can worsen significantly with climate change. So the form bloom team is showing, if you can see the image on the screen, the colorful image on the right, this is Lake 227 in the Experimental Lakes area in northwestern Ontario. And what we're seeing here is the evolution of a second peak, uh, a second bloom peak in recent years. And it's happening despite the fact that nitrogen inputs have been decreased. So this tells us that even with efforts to mitigate nutrient loading, there will be a longer period of bloom related risks. The other graph on the screen is showing Buffalo Pound Lake, which is a crucial drinking water supply in Saskatchewan. And we see that there's been an abrupt shift in annual bloom severity, which appears to be driven by high higher peak water temperatures. So blooms like it hot. So warmer waters, worsening bloom risk, and this is going to create challenges for our drinking water treatment. Our teams are also exploring how climate, land management, irrigation, and drainage are impacting water supply and runoff from agriculture. So the internet, um, sorry, the IMPC team, the International Modeling Program of Canada team is developing and working with watershed, river, and lake models. And they're looking at fluxes from the land surface into rivers and lakes, but also, also within the receiving waters themselves. So what is leaving from the terrestrial zones of the watersheds into the water and how is it being processed and transformed as it moves and then what is happening to it once it enters into a receiving water body. This is really that comprehensive understanding that we need and once we have these wonderful powerful models we can then do things like test scenarios of future climates or what if we change how we operate dams or we apply the beneficial management practices on fields. So this is, these, this is an example of some of the scenarios that we can test. The Prairie Water Futures team the, it has been looking at uh, water use in the prairies and one emphasis is around wetland drainage. And what they've shown is that stream flow responses to wetland drainage differ. They differ between landscape types, but they also differ with climate. And so climate warming, given that it's expected to decrease snowpacks and reduce, and reduce runoff, this can obviously have implications in these drained systems. Now, if the precipitation increases with climate change, this may offset the, the, the um, effects of warning, warming, but at the same time, the more precipitation that falls as rain may actually change the seasonality of runoff. So a lot of what they're looking at is how landscape changes and the climate may affect both the supply but also the timing of that runoff. 
So in addition to um, managing surface drainage, wetland drainage, more and more farmers are looking at tile drainage to rapidly drain fields, particularly under the risk of climate change. And the problem with this is that it can impact both nitrogen and phosphorus transport in the landscape. So the Agricultural Water Futures team has been looking at the effects of tile drainage. And so in the Great Lakes region, so if we look on screen at the graph, pie charts on the screen, we see the Great Lakes region on the right with the blue titles, and then we have a Red River Valley clay, so that's in the Manito in Manitoba, very close to Winnipeg. And what we see, the blue in the pie charts is tile drainage, and the orange is surface runoff. And so what we see in the Great Lakes region, 80% of the flow happens, flows below the surface. And once we get into the rolling hills throughout some areas, sort of the Midwestern Ontario and eastward, and certainly in the Grand River watershed, surface runoff is your primary pathway for phosphorus runoff. But once you get into the clays down towards the southwestern end of Ontario, surface, tile drainage plays a much more substantial role in the tile in the phosphorus story. So in light of what we're seeing in those heavy clays, the fact that we're seeing increased incidences of tile drainage in the west, there is concern that in these clay soils that tile drains are going to accelerate phosphorus issues and you already have them with Lake Winnipeg. So what we found is that even though even with tile drainage because most of the runoff is happening in the spring snowmelt period, most of the phosphorus is being lost in the surface because the tiles are essentially frozen. The soils above the tiles are effectively frozen and very little water can actually get into the tiles. So the tiles don't appear to be doing too much for phosphorus at this point, but across all of the landscapes, they're going to do some, uh, sorry, not doing much in the prairies anyway, but they're important in Ontario, but they're important for nitrogen across all of the landscapes. Another factor that we've been looking at in the Agricultural Water Futures team is other management practices. So this is some of the work from our Western counterparts in the Ag, Ag Water Futures team that have done work on soil test phosphorus. And so what they looked at is whether or not they could draw down soil test phosphorus through agronomic, the way they were agronomically managing that phosphorus, if they could draw that down and if that would have an impact on phosphorus and runoff. And they found that it did. It substantially reduced phosphorus and runoff and it had no impact on yield. So this number one tells us that we can make a difference but also tells us that possibly we should be revisiting our agronomic guidelines for what people should be applying to their fields. So although we have the ability to change what we do, we also have to manage our expectations in terms of when we might actually see a response because there are lag times between when we change our practices and when we're going to see a response. So the Lake Futures team has shown that lag, so in the Grand River watersheds, the Lake Futures team has shown that um, in the Grand River watershed, lag times to um, changing nitrogen, what we apply in terms of nitrogen, are going, the lag time between when we change our behavior and when we have a response, it's going to basically be on the order of about 10 to 30 years. This is really important when we think about meeting targets in terms of the reduction of nutrients in our runoff. And they're also looking, doing some great work in modeling of phosphorus in the Grand River watershed. And they've been able to show with these models where that phosphorus is hiding. And what they're finding is that a lot of the phosphorus in the Grand River watershed is accumulating in the soil as legacy pea. And so even after we change our behaviors, we are going to find that that legacy pea is going to take time to get through the system. So when we start to think about the future, we have to realize the importance of both lag times and legacies. So everything that I've talked about before now has tried to give you that high level view of some of the progress that we've made through the Global Water Futures projects with regards to agriculture, a little bit of what we've done, a little bit of where we're going next. And a lot of the leads of these projects are on the call today and can give much more insight into what their specific teams are doing in the panel session. Now we know that sustainable agriculture is a wicked problem because in addition to the science that I've talked about today, we have to remember these are people, this is their sustainability, this is their, their livelihood. And so many of our teams are working with the people in terms of why they make their decisions. How can we assist them in getting to where they need to be? What are the impacts on local 
local communities? What are the impacts on indigenous communities? So we're working tightly within our team on these issues, but we're also working with our government and non-government partners to co-develop solutions. So this has been central to the Global Water Futures Program, and we hope that it will also be central in a Canadian water agency. That's everything I have for today, so thank you. Thanks so much, Marin. Okay, we're gonna transition into a moderated panel. Um, before that, uh, just apologies to everybody for the maximum capacity issues at the beginning. I think we got it sorted and have tried to communicate with folks who weren't able to get in. So, uh, so hopefully everybody who wants to be here is here now. Um, also, just a quick note to all of our speakers who will be uh, going forward. We've had a request from the translators to try and slow down a little bit um, in order for the translator to be able to keep up. Thanks. Uh, okay, so uh, our moderated panel session uh, is going to be moderated by Dr. Sean Carey. Sean is a professor uh, in the School of Geography and Earth Sciences at McMaster University. Um, I am also going to quickly share my screen, just so you have a look at who will be speaking. There we go. Okay, so uh, Dr. Helen Balch, she's an associate professor in the School of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, Dr. Chris Spence is a research scientist with Environment and Climate Change Canada based at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Warren Helgeson is associate professor in the Department of Civil Engineering, Geo Geological and Environmental Engineering at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Ron Stewart is a professor in the Department of Environment and Geography at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Carl Lindenschmidt is a, an associate professor in the School of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Nandita Basu is an associate professor in Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Waterloo. And Dr. Mary McRae, again, who is a professor at the in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management at the University of Waterloo. So I'm going to uh, pass it over to Sean, who will uh, throw some questions to our panel, our panelists. The, the kind of the point of the panelists um, session is to allow the researchers who contributed to Marin's overview presentation to get a little bit deeper into some of the aspects of their own research, speak to it themselves, um, and hopefully open up some uh, interest into that specific research topic and uh, hopefully solicit some questions and comments from all of our participants. Um, and I encourage you as you are listening to uh, put some comments or questions into the chat box and Nancy and I will collect those and, uh, and we'll have a question and answer period after. Okay, take it away, Sean. All right, I think I've unmuted myself. Thanks so much for the opportunity to, uh, to moderate this panel. I was on a little late, but I, I saw most of John's presentation and all of Marin's. It brings me back to my days as an undergraduate at the Ontario Agriculture College, and some of the issues 30 years ago haven't changed too much. Uh, one of the issues that, that first started off that I want to talk to is uh, a question for Ron Stewart. And I have a number of farmers in the family, and the, one of the biggest thing that's always talked about is the weather. And uh, the weather and the climate, people often get misconstrued or have different views. But, but the question I have for you is, uh, how will, or will agriculture in the future need to adapt or even simply cope with the changes to the extremes because that we're seeing? We'll see the hail in Calgary, which obviously would have large implications to crops. So I'm just wondering what your views on uh, how farmers will need to adapt or simply cope in the future. Well, thanks, Sean. Uh, I grew up on a farm as well, so I know all about the weather. So we're always talking of maybe next year will be better. We won't have that hailstorm or that flood. So uh, it's sort of part of me. I'll just add a little bit to what Miriam's already done. Uh, just a little bit of detail, a little bit of a repeat. I'll just talk about three different types of extremes and how uh, we're looking into those and their future occurrence or their characteristics. In terms of drought, uh, there's been many studies actually have been carried out looking at uh, dry conditions in the future, but actually not too many have actually talked about the drought events themselves. 
And not surprisingly, as Merritt has already told you, uh, the expectation is we'll have more droughts. When they occur, they should be more severe. And in fact, they'll persist longer. But interestingly, all droughts go through a life cycle. They go through a growth phase, they persist, and then they decay. We've actually expected that the growth and decay stage uh, might be different in the future than what they currently are. Uh, but so far, there's no evidence to that, despite the fact that the hydrologic cycle should be heated up. Another important topic that you just mentioned is hail. Uh, I remember currently on our farm, our whole livelihood for the year was done within a couple of minutes, and I'm sure farmers in around Alberta are experiencing that right now, uh, June 13, 2020. Uh, and furthermore, that was associated with a huge amount of flash flooding. Uh, there's been quite a bit of work currently underway trying to anticipate whether such events with their hail and associated precepts will change in the future. It's a really difficult problem. Uh, these are small scale events and you're trying to predict the occurrence of big chunks of ice coming out of the sky. Uh, the current projections imply the fact that the western prairies may very well have more uh, hail in the future, whereas the eastern prairies may have fewer such events. But interestingly, the size of the hail may actually uh, be larger in the future, regardless of where you are. And that includes the eastern prairies where we may have fewer events, but in fact, they may produce larger hailstorms. Now, uh, this is related to the fact that the storms may be more vigorous with higher liquid water contents to produce larger hail. I may add that our current thinking is the fact that hail may actually tend to become worse until approximately mid 21st century before becoming less so. And the reason for that is not good, unfortunately. That's only because drought will be so dominant that hail, rare now, may become even rare as you're in a drought. The last thing I want to talk about is daily or multi-day precipitation events. Uh, there's been numerous studies documenting the increase in the precip from these events over North America over the last several decades. And approximately a month ago, uh, an article came out definitively showing that the culprit behind this is anthropogenic warming. When you have uh, higher temperatures, you can hold more water vapor, there's more water vapor available from the surrounding oceans. So when these events happen, you produce more rain rainfall. Unfortunately, the paper also pointed out the obvious, of course, in the future with even warmer, uh, excuse me, higher temperatures with more water vapor, when we very well anticipate uh, even higher precip from these major events. So unfortunately, it seems whenever we're looking at extremes and their future occurrence or some characteristics of them, inevitably we find that they're going to get worse. So unfortunately, and I'm speaking as an old farm boy myself, uh, agriculture has always had to deal with extremes. Unfortunately, we're going to have to deal with uh, even more severe extremes, in, in my opinion. So that's my short answer to your question, Sean. Oh, thanks, Ron. It's very sobering. Uh to hear, but I, probably not a surprise to most. And I think it leads me into my next question, which I want to direct at uh, Dr. Warren Helgeson from the University of Saskatchewan. And it goes to climate because, you know, extremes is one issue, but but a lot of folks mention that um, there's going to be large change to the growing season uh, in, in a warmer world. So I'm just wondering, Warren, if you can uh, elaborate what type of changes to the growing season we will expect and, and how might water use needs of future crops change or changing crop because of different water resources? I was just wondering what your perspectives on that were. Yeah, sure. So, uh, of course, we don't have a crystal ball, but uh, the best we can do is try to interpret some of the, uh, the numerous um, model predictions. So many groups around the world, of course, and, and throughout Canada are running um, climate models. And so we're trying to interpret their results uh, in an agricultural context, right? And I think uh, one of the, one of the, one, one place of agreement that, that pretty much all of the models have is, is they're all predicting, of course, warmer temperatures, uh, which lead to an earlier start to the growing season, uh, more accumulated heat units. And then under, under uh, increased CO2, of course, then there's a positive effect for growth, uh, um, just sort of the, the carbon dioxide fertilization effect. So, so there's a number of, of perceived positive um, impacts to the growing season um, that are predicted in the future. Um, but there's perhaps some, some negative ones. And so Ron has talked about extreme events and, and more droughts and stuff like that. But I think, I think uh, interpreting the, the warmer temperatures, um, along with the warmer temperatures, of course, because a lot of extreme temperatures. And so we need to think about that um, from the plant physiological perspective a little bit. Um, and so, so if we see 
um, the, the number of days, like I think the, the graph that Marin showed, the number of, of days above 30 going from, from about 10 up to about 50 or something like that towards the end of the century. Um, you know, so if those, if those warm days come at the time when, when you know, a grain crop is trying to, to, to fill its, its seed, for example, um, we could have early, early termination of grain, uh, grain filling or, or senescence of lease, et cetera. And so there's a number of, of negative effects that could really limit the, uh, the potential for growing the crops that we currently do, right? So, um, so there's also been lots of talk about how, how farmers might adapt, right? So um, within the prairies here, I think there's lots of thought that, that, well, we can just bring corn or soybean. And so warm season crops, um, crops that they grow in warmer areas, such as southern Ontario, um, perhaps maybe those could be adapted to just grow within the prairies. And, uh, and, and perhaps they could, but I think the, the question is whether or not there would be sufficient water to actually do that. Um, so there's less agreement between climate models in, in terms of what future precipitation patterns might look like. Um, so, so this is something that, that we're trying to, to tease out um, with, with some of our modeling activities. Um, and then I guess trying to identify areas where perhaps there won't be enough precipitation or soil moisture, um, where irrigation could potentially play a larger role. Yeah, thanks, Warren. I think I'll, I'll ask Carl about irrigation in a second, but Marin, I have a question for you. Um, you know, you, you talked briefly about tile drains, and uh, tile drains are ubiquitous here across Ontario, and uh, and how they basically differ across regions and how they, you know, and sort of what their role was. And I found that really interesting. But I was also wondering, you know, there's lots of different practices uh, on the farm, and have you looked at other land management practices and how they differ and the impact of that across uh, agriculture water futures program? Yeah, in fact, we have. That's been um, one of the things that has been rather central to, to what we've been doing. So earlier I talked about um, some of the work that the Agricultural Water Futures team has done. So the work of um, postdoc Jean Lu looked at soil phosphorus management um, and a drawdown of that soil phosphorus. So things like soil phosphorus management is really important when we, because we know that lowering soil phosphorus can make a difference, especially where you have legacy buildup. The question is, what are reasonable application rates for the different regions and crops, and should these be revisited? But the fact is that lowering phosphorus is something, is an example of something that is going to work across any of the landscapes. So soil phosphorus is really closely really connected with the four R's. So that's the right rate, right uh, place, right time, right tight. These are a great way to go in terms of, of nutrient application. Sorry, they're a great way to go and probably one of the most significant things that you can do to manage nutrient loss. But we're still working on what those specific for our practices might be and if and how they might vary across regions, both due to climate and landscape and influences, but also the differences in production systems across the regions. And we also have to remember that phosphorus is not the only issue. Nitrogen is, nitrogen is important too. Water quality issues are relevant, but we also have to think about greenhouse gas emissions and soil health. So we're trying to be you know, comprehensive. So, in a, so I gave you an example of something that would work probably pretty much everywhere in terms of the soil phosphorus regulation, but there are things that actually are a little bit more regionally specific. So cover crops would be an example of that. So cover crops are something that's great for soil health, great for nitrogen. It can hold on temporarily to the phosphorus before the plants die. So the problem with those cover crops that are planted in the, the fall that are going to get us through the winter is that in the prairies, because of the severity of the climate, these things are killed. And then when the snow melt happens in the springtime, all of that dissolved phosphorus gets released into surface water bodies. So cover crops have the potential to really accelerate phosphorus losses in a prairie system. But in Ontario, where we have a lot of snowpack and less extreme frosts, what we find is that a lot of our cover crop species can overwinter and can get through without those phosphorus losses. And for those that are frost killed, they, they essentially, a lot of that phosphorus goes into the soil from fall rains long before snow melt happens. So cover crops are really an example of something that are very regionally appropriate. They can do, they can be really important in one landscape in terms of being effective. And if we think about erosion issues, they can make a big 
big difference, which can be a big issue in Ontario, whereas in the prairies where dissolved phosphorus is the biggest issue, that they may actually make things worse. And during my presentation, I talked about tile drainage. So yeah, there's lots and lots of evidence of where things are regionally appropriate, and we're trying to work on that as a group. Thanks, Marin. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation as well um, about wetlands, and I think I'd like to direct this question to uh, Dr. Chris Spence. Um, we've been managing wetlands and draining them in Canada for hundreds of years. A lot of Ontario is on drained wetlands, but it's still an issue and it's still quite contentious. So uh, I was wondering, Chris, if you could, you know, discuss what the big questions are relating to flooding, particularly in the prairie, prairies with regards to wetland drainage. I know it's a really big open a question in the agriculture and research communities and what are the gaps what don't we know like to, to this day after hundreds of years regarding wetland drainage and uh, things to be addressed in that matter yeah thanks Sean I hope everybody can hear me all right um, it, it you're right that we've been draining wetlands for a long time and the uh, it, it's it's pretty clear from the science that we know by removing the, the storage capacity that's attached to every sort of wetland or wetland depression, uh, doing so sort of enhances the, uh, the ability of the landscape to shed the water. And, and that's, that's why people drain wetlands is to get that water off the landscape. So uh, we, we understand that. What we don't understand necessarily is how this upscales to the sort of larger scales and the the larger watersheds because it's it's really difficult to disentangle everything that's going on across a, a wide complex of wetlands. I think that's how we have to start thinking about them is, is not individual wetlands but viewing them as a, as a complex uh, but diversity of uh, different wetlands with different sort of permanency on the landscape as well and because there's different antecedent storage that goes on every time. So it's been really difficult to, to figure out what draining numerous wetlands does to the sort of the flood frequency regime. And, and there's some work that John has done that, that indicates that uh, it's not the smallest floods or the largest floods that are, that are impacted by these kinds of landscape changes, but the, the moderate ones, sort of the one in five, the one in 10 year floods. Um, but what we don't know, and, and Marin touched on this in, in her presentation is that we don't know how this differs between different landscapes um, and uh, sort of how the the antecedent uh, or the, the the wetland distribution that there that's there presently uh, influences how the, the watershed is going to respond so we don't know that we don't know um, how climate mixes it all in into all of this and uh, and, and the climate's changing, so we're dealing with this, this really difficult problem where there's a lot of things in the stew pot uh, and, uh, and trying to figure out what uh, controls certain things makes it, makes it difficult to come up with sort of robust policies and even allow agricultural producers to sort of make informed decisions. Uh, so uh, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done on the modeling side. Uh, it used to be that the, the Canadian prairies in particular were a place where hydrological models would go to die. They uh, didn't particularly perform very well, but I, in the last decade or so, I, there's been some clear advances in, in what we've been able to do. So uh, applying these types of tools um, in, in many ways will help us disentangle some of these things and uh, what the, uh, the impact is sort of further downstream and uh, and then once we can figure out what specific um, uh, the the control of specific things like climate, uh, wetland distribution, uh, agricultural practices has on the sort of the eventual response of a of a watershed to wetland drainage, we can start to take that knowledge and uh, and put it to sort of specific uh, situations where people can uh, apply this knowledge in a very sort of practical way. So, uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Chris, for the for that uh, nuanced answer about wetlands. It sounds like there's still a lot more. I'm watching the chat on the right, and I know folks will have an opportunity to ask people questions. But one of the questions that came up, and I was curious about, I think I'll direct to Carl Eric Lindenschmidt, uh, who works quite heavily on the integrated modeling program. Is that you know we hear a lot about increased water demand from irrigation. It always comes up year after year. 
uh, in the prairie context and other contexts as well. So my general question is, is what is the impact of this irrigation to water downstream, to the outlook of future water supply and demand? Does, will irrigation affect the flows in our rivers? I was just wondering if um, any of your work can shed light on some of these broader questions. Yes, so um, thanks, Sean. So as you mentioned, uh, I'm on the integrated modeling program for Canada, and uh, uh, we do have a lot of models set up now that um, we did in our first phase of the GWF uh, program and are continuing now to run many scenarios. And we actually have run uh, some scenarios too, just looking at uh, uh, the prospect of um, extending our irrigation network um, um, between, between uh, Lake Diefenbaker and um, along uh, the Capel Valley and uh, a big uh, receiver of water there too is Buffalo Pound Lake. So now with, with these lake malls, we're able to uh, see how diverting more water from one lake, Lake Diefenbaker to Buffalo Pound Lake might have an impact on, on, on the water quality of these lakes. And then also um, extending that modeling activity to see how uh, maybe return flow from um, irrigated fields uh, can further impact the water quality of these uh, receiving waters. Um, maybe some observations. I myself uh, live in an irrigation district. It's uh, um, uh, south is, or um, well, east of Sa Saskatoon along the South Saskatchewan River. There is a, um, a network of channels and reservoirs that were constructed to uh, uh, supplement uh, water supply in the area, um, not just for the potash mines, but also for irrigation. And um, I actually live on one of those uh, close by to one of those reservoirs and I've got to got to know many of the food producers here um, in the area including um, some of not just uh, single family or um, uh, family farms but also large operations such as at Hutterite colonies and uh, um, it appears that um, the cost of the um, the infrastructure for irrigation seems to only be fathomable for those that are of larger uh, operations and have um, larger capital, uh, for instance, the Hutterite colony. And they appear to be the only ones drawing on, on that um, reservoir water that, from that system here for that. So in, in the future, we think we have to also uh, look at uh, perhaps financial programs where we can also help um, get some of that irrigated water, irrigation water to uh, local uh, small uh, farm farms in, in these communities here. Okay. Thanks, Carl. You mentioned um, water quality in some of the modeling. I sort of like to pivot now and because uh, there's a lot of sort of research in global water futures concerned with water quality of rivers and lakes and so my next question is for uh, Dr. Nandita Basu at uh, the University of Waterloo and some of the work that you've done on legacies and it's gotten a lot of attention in the scientific community and we know precipitation events wash a lot of excess nutrients uh, from agriculture and urban areas into uh, streams and rivers with negative uh, consequences on water quality but but what do we really know about these legacy nutrients uh, or the long-term buildup of phosphorus and nitrogen? Uh, what are these legacy nutrients? Where are they on their landscape? And, and how do we manage this issue? It's sort of a vexing sort of long-term issue to sort of short-term action. So I was just wondering if you could give some, some thoughts on that. Usually with Zoom sometimes. Thank you, Sean. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? You bet, Nadita. Um, thank you, Sean. Um, so we now know for certain that uh, you have these legacies of nitrogen and phosphorus 
from decades of agricultural activities. And these legacies are in our soils, in our groundwater, in the sediments of our lakes and reservoirs. The reason it's really important to understand this legacy accumulation, because let's say in one year, you apply no fertilizer in your soils, but there's a major rainfall event or a major slow melt event, you will see high phosphorus concentrations in your streams and lakes. And this is where the legacy contributes to these high phosphorus concentration. And because of these legacies, when we make some changes on the landscape scale, it takes some time to see the effect of these changes. From a management perspective, we have a tendency to think about legacies as a bad thing. It'll take a long time for water quality to improve. I wanted us to pivot that idea and think about less legacy as not necessarily a bad thing. Because think about it, if you have a lot of legacy phosphorus in our soil, we can potentially have the same crop yield by applying much, much less fertilizer. And at the same time, our water quality would improve. So we can have economic benefits in terms of applying less fertilizers as well as environmental benefits. So potentially a win-win situation. And this has been shown in projects in global water futures at the local, at the field scale, where there is evidence of applying less fertilizers, drawing down that legacy phosphorus that builds up in our soil and actually improving water quality in the runoff from those plots of land. But to take this and to scale it up, to say, well, what's happening at the landscape scale? To understand that question, we need to figure out at the large landscape scale where this legacy is hiding and how extreme climate event can access those legacy mass in the landscape. This requires a tremendous amount of data synthesis and modeling, something again that an organization at the scale of the Canadian Water Agency can handle at the pan-Canadian scale. It requires us to go through our amazingly curated ag databases and quantify not only how much fertilizer we are putting on the landscape today, but how much have we put in the past 10, 15 years. In Lake Futures, we have been developing lake and watershed models that help us identify where this legacy is accumulating, what would be the time lags to water quality improvement if we implement various BMPs, and most importantly, how can we speed up this process by explicit knowledge and targeting of these legacy hotspots? For example, if we know that in one landscape region has more legacy P, then we can apply less phosphorus fertilizer to that landscape, and then uh, we will see a faster improvement in water quality. Thank Thanks you. Very, thanks very much. I think I'm conscious of time, but I have one more question, uh, and I think before we open it up to the broader discussion, and that's to Dr. Helen Balch of the U of S, who leads this uh, four bloom project, which is, you know, very much concerned with the uh, algal blooms in our lakes. It's the time of year we all want to get in the water, certainly here in Ontario, and sometimes that uh, isn't necessarily possible. So what's the prognosis for lake ecosystems in Canada? And how do we see solutions to these current problems, particularly that of harmful algal blooms? Um, Sean, I think, uh, I think the answer is pretty clear from what we've talked about so far. The prognosis isn't very good. Um, we have a lot of lakes in Canada that are already showing symptoms of nutrient pollution and indeed, you know, we've seen that for decades and we also see it in the headline news in terms of impacts on uh, lakes Winnipeg and uh, Lake Winnipeg and Lake Erie. Um, we know that lakes take a long time to recover from stressors. Uh, so things like legacy watershed nutrients like Nanda that just mentioned, and then the ecology of lakes themselves uh, can really reinforce a degraded state. So they get stuck in a condition and it's harder to get them out of the condition, the degraded condition than it was to initially push them into it. Um, and it's worth noting that these are, you know, that's just one type of impact upon lakes. When we think about these impacts, there's many, many others, invasive species, uh, pesticide usage, um, mercury pollution, and so on. So a lot of changes, a lot of stressors impacting the lakes that we really enjoy this time of year. Um, I think one key thing to note is the changes can happen really fast. And we saw that in Buffalo Pound Lake in terms of a really quick shift to much more degraded water quality conditions. And that's really important when we're thinking about building for the future and infrastructure for the future. So if we think 30 years ahead, um, what is the water treatment plan we need to build so that it's resilient to how water quality might change? So I think in terms of the prognosis, you know, we're combining nutrient-related stressors that have built over decades with climate stressors, and that 
really helps build a perfect storm because lakes are more sensitive to nutrients at higher temperatures. Um, but if we want to think about solutions, and I think we have to, uh, the place-based efforts that um, Marin's spoken about and Anita has spoken about are really important. And they are grounded in knowing the agriculture of the region, the climate of the region, the ecology of lakes in the region. Because we really need to you know, build this capacity to marry uh, appropriate solutions with the appropriate landscapes to help ensure um, continued productive agriculture and lakes with the ecosystem services that we want. So we've seen some good news on this, you know, soil phosphorus is really one area where we can manage and um, can see some, some benefits pretty quickly. Um, but there's a lot more concerted work to be done on this. And I think it's also important to um, go back to some of Ron's comments about the stresses of being a farmer and hailstorms and so on and think about you know, how can we find solutions that work for everyone uh, without pointing fingers, recognizing that as a society, we need to look towards, you know, what we want our future landscapes and uh, lake ecosystems to look like. Yeah, thanks very much, Helen, for uh, that sort of response. It's, uh, I also really want to thank the panel for, uh, for all of their answers. That was uh, kind of, I think, really fleshed out some of the more good work and detail that's being done in these GWF projects. I'm monitoring the chat on the side and conscious of time. So I think there's still going to be some, uh, some of your expertise called upon. But I think at this point, I'll just thank you again and uh, send it back to Nancy or Stephanie, or Stephanie, I guess, who's controlling the Zoom meeting and the, and the sequence of, of events. So uh, thanks again. And thanks to Marin and John for their presentations. And I see that there's lots of uh, chatter going on in the room. And I think now we'll have to address some of those questions. Great, thanks so much, John. That was perfect. Um, we have about 15 minutes to address some of the questions from, uh, from the uh, participants. And I think I'll start with a question for, for Carl. Um, so we had a follow up to the discussion about irrigation. Um, somebody's asking about um, whether or not there's any work being done with respect to the limitations of irrigation, uh, especially on, on, um, on water bodies, rivers, and uh, things like minimum flow requirements within rivers. Um, and then conversely, is there any work being done um, uh, to look at um, the fact that a lot of prairie farms are located very far from water sources um, and so uh, is there any any work being done with respect to that? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. So in our modeling efforts, we do couple many models together to get sort of the bigger picture of, uh, uh, of our water quality situation. And included with my water quality modeling is also water resources uh, model, which looks at um, scenarios for different supply and demand uh, scenarios. So yes, uh, that work is uh, being carried out, yeah. Um, and uh, also to that model is also coupled um, hydrological models, which looks at precipitation rain runoff. And that will also help uh, determine what the future runoff will be from these land surfaces uh, in, the, um, in the framework of climate change, yes. And uh, for your second question, and I think this is also important, is uh, bringing the water to the irrigation districts. Um, so we do already have some of those here in uh, Saskatchewan, and we're looking at uh, the impacts of extending those, yeah. So, um, so there are uh, different scenarios that are being explored right now to um, extend those either west of Lake Deepin Bake or or east, yeah, or in, in other um, areas. Uh, so, yeah, those have already been uh, those scenarios have already been uh, integrated in our models. We're still working on them and. Uh, uh, Improving on them, there's uh, still data to be collected for those, uh, but hopefully, um, you know, we and then coming um, uh, soon that we'll be able to give more concrete uh, um, results on that. <coughs> uh, 
Thanks so much, Carl. Um, I think the next question might uh, be a tag team effort maybe between Helen and Nandita. Uh, how will poor water quality potentially impact uh, traditional uses in terms of biodiversity? So things like fisheries or recreational water uses. I can start. I mean, that's a, a huge question. And um, I saw Bjorn ask that. So I think Bjorn in many ways has lots of good answers to that question too. Um, it's, a, it's a really tricky nuanced one because uh, oftentimes we're trading ecosystem services, right? So a little bit of extra nutrients in some lakes can actually increase fisheries, um, but you can quickly hit a tipping point where um, you can have a, a very strongly impacted lake ecosystem, which really doesn't support any of the ecosystem services you're after. So there's a really place-based aspect in terms of the ecology of a lake naturally, the ecosystem services it provides and the usages that are wanted, um, including traditional usages, uh, and how the impacts on a lake are received by that. So um, that's a, a deep, uh, deep and long question we could get into there perhaps in the breakouts a bit more. Nandita, did you have uh, anything to add no, there? No, you covered it all. I mean, I, I don't <laughs> think there's anything more. I mean, it, it's really, it's a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a question that takes a long time to answer, except. Yeah, I think it's it, an important emphasis that water quality and ecosystem services are much, much more than, you know, the algae present in the lake. There's a, um, a lot of considerations uh, that we need to think about. you both. Uh, okay, maybe a question for Ron. Um, and uh, if John Pomeroy also would like to chime in if, if he feels appropriate. Uh, so, um, someone has submitted that um, many of the flooding, uh, flooding events experienced to date um, have been uh, caused by land management issues uh, more so than, than climate change. So does this mean that um, we should be looking more to uh, land use practices and, and policy changes more so than, than climate policy changes and, and wondering if you could comment on that. Uh, I actually think John probably can answer that better than I can. But I have done studies of the major flooding in the Assiniboine River in 2011 and 2014. There's no question there was a huge amount of precipitation in those events. And on the other hand, uh, we all know that the landscape has been changed dramatically. Uh, and in fact, I think John, hopefully you're going to answer that. I have more quantitative information. I don't think we can explain the flooding any of the else. Where I grew up in Western Manitoba, we used to have sloughs everywhere and after a rainstorm, the, the water would pool into those. But nowadays there's no sloughs left. It's not a tree anywhere. And the water simply goes into the ditches and enhances the flooding. Uh, so I know from a personal experience, but John, I think you'd be the better person to answer. In detail as well. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ron. The, of course, flooding can only proceed if we have heavy rainfall or massive snowmelt occurring over a large area. So it's, it's ultimately that climate driver that's in there. And as you uh, noted, uh, some of the changes in, uh, in precipitation and uh, melt timing and others have uh, caused floods that were really unprecedented in the history of the, the prairies. Uh, the 2014 midsummer flooding in June and July over Saskatchewan, Manitoba was entirely rainfall driven in an area that normally gets snowmelt floods. But, the, uh, but land use also matters. And so uh, uh, natural depressions can hold water back uh, if they have capacity. Uh, uh, crops and vegetation can use water. And so how we, uh, and soils can hold water, uh, but they hold less if they're drained. and Depressions and wetlands hold less if they're drained, and the uh, and if we're going to monoculture uh, crops, and uh, we can change the evapotranspiration losses as well. So all this fits together, and we can certainly dial up or dial down those floods and extreme events uh, through how we manage our wetlands, our depressional storage, and our land use on these areas. And uh, the uh, fairly rapid drainage of wetlands in some parts of the eastern prairies uh, made some of the floods that were going to occur probably larger. And that, that's certainly our estimation at this point. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question about uh, 
food security. And so maybe I'll call on Marin uh, to address this one. So one of the fundamental problems with food security can be food waste. And uh, we're wondering if uh, any of your research can help uh, address food waste. Well, it, uh, it is not something that we have been looking at previously, but it, I mean, it's something that we probably could and should look into. So. And is there, do you think there's a connection between that um, concept of, of food waste and, and water security? Is there, a, is there a direct linkage there? Um, well, I mean, <laughs> I'm freezing here. I don't have a good answer. I'm so sorry. <laughs> John, do you want to take this one? I can dive in for you, Marin. I think, you know, the fundamental um, behind the question is probably that, I don't know what the statistic is offhand. Is it a quarter of food that goes to waste? So, you know, if that food didn't go to waste, uh, you know, the land, the inputs to the land and so on would be very, very different. So um, it is, you know, one of the many sustainability related questions that has to be uh, addressed when we think about our food systems. Yeah. Thanks for the collaborative effort. If we weren't wasting as much food, then we might be able to feed some parts of the world where people don't get enough. So uh, that's the other factor there. I'm not sure it directly impacts our agricultural production in Canada, it depends on how we distribute it around the world, which is uh, outside of people order feeders. Great. Um, a, another question for Marin. Uh, somebody has pointed out that um, uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada has uh, worked on a study called Watershed Evaluation of Beneficial Management Practices. Uh, Marin, are you aware or a part of that work? Um, and, and if you are, can you speak to uh, kind of the status of, of that work in terms of um, where the research and analysis from that is is moving or heading? Yeah, the the Webs program um, was something that 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 has has been pretty amazing and has was something that that informed a lot of what we're doing currently. So we're building on a lot of that work. A lot of the study sites, like for example, the South Tobacco Creek watersheds, a lot of those sites uh, are the same sites or similar sites that were used in the webs that we are still building on and looking at that data. Some of the uh, issues that were identified early on in some of the earlier reports were that we had BMPs that were being monitored uh, over maybe a few years or conditions that were monitored over maybe a shorter period of time so what and, and the need for long-term data and so because there was so much amazing data that has been collected and so much time has passed since some of that work was done a lot of that is actually being incorporated into the work that we're doing now and we are looking at those time longer timelines and so I know some of the other things that were identified in the in their uh, as their outcomes had to do with the uptake and the efficacy uh, or not just the efficacy sorry the uptake of BMPs by farmers and the adoption. And so we're working with uh, the conservation authorities, with people in Ag Canada, and with our um, provincial governments as well, in terms of uh, incentivization or what is making people, what can we do to get people to adopt or what is a barrier to getting people to adopt. So there is a lot of crossover and a lot of, I mean, it's not replication, it's very much building on it, but definitely it's, it's been an, a central uh, component of what we've done. Great, great to make linkages between the past research and, and rolling that into what you're doing and, and how we're moving forward so we don't lose all of that back work. Um, I think a question for Chris Spence. Um, how can we share some of this science and knowledge uh, that's been presented uh, kind of at the, at the local level um, and especially with First Nations and in Indigenous communities? I know your project um, does have some partnerships uh, and, and has a bit more of a, a local scale to its work. Would you be able to speak a little bit to um, how you're doing that? Um, there we go. Um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it, it's all in partnership um, and, build, and about building relationships. Uh, and these things, these things often take time. Um, I, I don't think there's no recipe for it. I, I mean, 
this question gets asked uh, quite often about uh, you know how how do we how do we do knowledge mobilization and um, I always, uh, even though we seem to be doing a, a pretty good job in prairie water with it, um, uh, I often struggle with it. Uh, and I guess over the years, all I've learned about is that uh, it's um, building relationships, taking time, and um, maybe a bit of empathy, uh, learning where other, you know, other perspective, other other people's perspectives on on things and. And uh, and working together, right? Um, I, I think Marin touched on this a little bit in in her talk at the beginning. That um, you know, this is uh, you know, when it comes to producers, this is their livelihood. Uh, these are their families, um, and um, and and they they live this, right? Where we're just uh, we're we're academics. So um, <clears throat> I think it's a, it's important to. Uh, to listen to them, there's a, a great body of knowledge that they have uh, to, to tap into as well. So, uh, and and um, I, I guess my, my perspective on, uh, I guess, on the Indigenous thing as well is the same, right? And um, it's, it's about uh, building, building relationships, taking time, learning what, what people have to say and, and, and listening. And, uh, and, and in the end, I think we all want the same thing, right? And, and that is just... You know, a, a a good world for for us and our kids. So uh, uh, that's the uh, in, in, I think that's the end game for for a lot of us. So uh, that's it for me. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, maybe we'll end uh, with one more. It's a it's a pretty direct question, and I think it's uh, probably for Nandita. So, uh, what is more important for water quality management and agricultural watersheds in the Great Lakes Basin? Crop management or livestock management? Um, I would like to start with saying both, but livestock is a big component of the budget. We haven't talked much about livestock today here, so I just wanted to draw attention back to the fact that in some ways, livestock, the manure that's produced by the livestock, a lot of times they are uh, not really incorporated effectively as fertilizers. If you drive around in Southern Ontario, you can smell it when you're in your truck in winter. Uh, so they are put on the snow. So managing that manure is in some way, uh, could be an easy short-term solution. Uh, whereas crop management requires a lot of knowledge about the phosphorus uh, content of the soil, which is spatially variable and all that. So livestock management is something that is really, really important. Thanks. Uh, we do have some more questions and comments that, that were trickling in um, and Nancy and I will, will capture everything and, and we'll, we'll keep it. Maybe some of them are um, actually nicely related to this afternoon's um, discussions as well. So we'll carry a couple of those over um, and also um, try to get some answers to, uh, to folks that we didn't respond to in this live event. Um, so I think, I think we should uh, wrap up this uh, first session uh, right on time. I want to thank everybody for, uh, for being good timekeepers um, in this first half. And I invite everybody uh, to come back in one hour. We'll take a break. Come back in one hour, uh, regardless of your time zone. And uh, you can use the same link that you received to join the first session the meeting remains open for the entire um, the entire event. So come back in an hour, um, and we will get into some more conversation about moving from science to, to policy, um, and we'll have a little bit more engagement. We will um, we will experiment with some Zoom rooms with a large audience, things like that. This is part two of Global Water Futures Virtual Workshop Agriculture Considerations for the Canada Water Agency. I truly hope that uh, the entry into part two was smoother than part one. Uh, I, I think it was. So thanks again for coming. Uh, thanks for coming back. And if you uh, were unable to join us this morning, uh, but are here now, thanks for joining uh, this afternoon's discussion.
I uh, just wanted to reiter reiterate a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, so for those who have already heard this, just bear with me for a Uh, to simultaneous translation today. So if you prefer to listen in French, uh, you can click on uh, the globe uh, icon in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen uh, and choose the French option. And there you are placed into a channel which, uh, which has a French translation. Uh, everybody uh, was muted upon entry and we ask that everybody stays muted during all of the presentations and discussions and, and panels, unless you are speaking uh, or a guest uh, panelist, then uh, you can unmute yourself and your video, uh, or we can back up that for you if you forget. Um, the speaker view is the best for watching a uh, videos and for a shared screen. Uh, however, there won't be a shared screen uh, after my introduction slides. Um, you can use the, the chat box to submit some comments or some questions that you might want to. Which means I'm just. Sorry, I'm just going to pause there so we can get that done. And then I can go back to my home position. And Chris, I don't know if you wanted to talk a, a little bit about the residency. There we go. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so yes, yeah, so uh, feel free to use the chat box to throw in any comments or questions that percolate during the discussion. Um, we don't have a direct question and answer period in, in, in this part two, um, but if uh, uh, we can take some of those questions to the breakout session uh, or I can collect them and uh, try to get some responses to people after the event. Um, mm -hmm. The presentations and the panel, the entire event is event is being recorded. So, uh, so I will be circulating that um, within the next couple of days, and, and that is now especially important um, if you were unable to get in at the beginning. Of the so, just a quick recap. So, we've already uh, gone through part one of the agenda, uh, where we uh, heard a lot a lot of science um, from our Global Water Futures researchers and, and had good discussions based on some questions posed by participants. Uh, and really what you heard this morning is just a, you know, a skim off the top of uh, all of the research that is going on within the Global Water Futures program amongst many uh, hundreds of scientists and students uh, at multiple institutions across the country. Uh, so we can only uh, pick and choose the, the most relevant stuff for today, um, but there's so much more. Um, and as we are an, about the halfway point of the program, results and outputs and uh, products are now uh, coming to fruition. So we will have lots more to share uh, into the future and we'll probably be hosting some more opportunities to, to learn and update. Um, so for the second part, we're going to transition into kind of a science to policy conversation. Uh, we're going to have uh, an interview style presentation between the Honorable Ralph Goodale and John Pomeroy, our program director. And then we have six panelists uh, who have joined us today with a very with varying degrees of um, expertise and experience in um, policy, programming, implementation, uh, governance, all of the issues uh, in the kind of implementation space. Um, and we're very happy to have them join us today to help us transition this conversation from science to action. Um, I think we should just get right into it. Um, I think I will now introduce the Honorable Ralph Goodale, uh, our special guest today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, the federal, Ralph Goodale was the federal mem member of parliament for Regina, Wascana for 26 years, from 1993 to 2019. He holds a record as Regina's longest, Regina's longest serving elected representative in the House of Commons. With practical experience in agriculture, business, law, and broadcasting, Mr. Goodale served in the federal cabinet under three prime ministers. His portfolios included agriculture, natural resources, leader of the government in the House of Commons, public works, finance, and public safety. 
Having been raised on a dry land prairie farm, Mr. Goodale has had a lifelong interest in water, which he describes as Saskatchewan's most precious resource, and probably Canada's too. Uh, four of his federal cabinet posts involved responsibilities with respect to effective water management. He authored the current government, the current federal government's mandate and commitment to create a Canada Water Agency to build upon the spirit and the legacy of the former Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Administration. So thanks again for joining us. We're looking forward to hearing all about that vast experience. Uh, and I will turn it over to John to start your conversation. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you uh, so much, Stephanie, and uh, we're, we're delighted to have Ralph Goodale here. He um, has been a uh, long a, uh, a great friend of science and uh, someone who is engaged with science very much. I, I think I first met him almost 20 years ago when uh, there was a Canadian Geophysical Union and Eastern Snow Conference meeting in Ottawa. We were looking for some place for a banquet, and uh, he was able to help us get into the West Block of Parliament and gave a wonderful speech to us about the drought that was occurring at that time. Um, and the, and uh, anyway, but his various portfolios, he's uh, addressed water in, in so many different ways. So um, anyway, Mr. Goodale, let's uh, step him back into history a bit. Uh, you know, the, uh, I, I think many of the people here will wonder why you are so interested in water issues. And, uh, and you could explain a bit more of your background that's, uh, that's driven you with this, uh, this passion and vision for water. Well, John, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to join in this conversation today. Uh, I, I heard the first portion of the, uh, uh, the program uh, earlier this morning, and uh, certainly looking forward to the second part now, uh, on a topic that I consider to be uh, exceedingly important. As I've said, uh, I think water is our single most precious resource. Everything else depends uh, on our capacity to have clean, fresh, flowing water uh, that uh, is, a, is a tool for social and, and economic uh, development. Um, I, I guess my, my interest flows from, uh, as, as Stephanie said in the introduction, uh, from that background, born and raised uh, on a, a Saskatchewan family farm, a dry land farm south of Regina. Um, so I have seen firsthand the devastation that comes from years of drought and uh, the, uh, the disaster that can flow from uh, big storms and flooding, uh, all of which now are magnified because of the consequences of, uh, of climate change. When I was uh, growing up, going through high school, uh, the biggest single public works project uh, probably in the history of Saskatchewan was, under, was being undertaken with the construction of uh, Gardner Dam and Diefenbaker, the creation of Diefenbaker Lake. Uh, and that huge reservoir that is, uh, uh, has the capacity to really transform uh, the uh, economic and, uh, and social well-being of, uh, of Saskatchewan. That was, a, that was a big deal back in, in the 1960s and was um, opened as a centennial project in, uh, in 1967. Uh, and then later on, uh, when I uh, became uh, a minister in the Government of Canada, uh, several of the portfolios that I was responsible for uh, had a very big water component, agriculture, obviously, uh, and PFRA, the Prairie <laughs> Farm Rehabilitation Administration, was a part of the Department of Agriculture at that time and reported to the House of Commons uh, through me as the, uh, as the Minister of Agriculture. Natural Resources Canada uh, is also uh, very interested in water and has, for example, the responsibility for flood mapping uh, across the country. Uh, finance uh, is often called upon to pay the bills uh, when, uh, when something goes wrong with, uh, with water. Uh, and in my public safety portfolio, which was the last one that I held in the, in the federal government, uh, that's the portfolio responsible for uh, emergency preparedness, for dealing with the disaster financial assistance arrangement, the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund. Those are uh, multi-billion dollar commitments by uh, the Government of Canada. And uh, as I saw the checks going out, paying for the disasters after the fact, uh, for the floods and the wildfires, it just seemed to me to make a lot more logical sense to develop the plan where you can build the infrastructure and the other systems and policies based on sound science and engineering that would uh, 
better develop, control, and manage our, our precious water resources in advance rather than just cleaning up the messes after the fact. So uh, for all of those reasons, yes, I am very, very interested in water. Yes, okay. That's great. And, and of course, we've seen that very consistently uh, through your career with your statements and, and pronouncements and vision. The, um, with many government departments that have an element of water to them, which mm -hmm. perhaps uh, is part of the problem uh, that we have. Yeah. Not that you were serving with them, but that we had so many government departments dealing with the water issue, uh, uh, as much as 20 different units across the federal government. But, but one in particular, uh, was extremely important to the uh, development of Western Canada and its recovery from the 1930s. And, uh, and it was a, a federal government agency established uh, in response to an extreme event and to help uh, conservation and uh, water development for farming. And that was the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Administration. And, the, uh, and, and so we, we used to have very strong federal services from water in at least that region and at the end of its time, PFRA actually went national. So we had had the opportunity for this uh, national PFRA, which uh, unfortunately was lost. And I, I just wondering, what, what do you think is missing now from this uh, federal constellation of water governance and uh, science and engineering services? Uh, I thought PFRA was probably the uh, single most successful agency of the government of Canada operating on the prairies. It, it had a lot of... Uh, um, grassroots respect and, uh, and support. Uh, and I think it was uh, a short sighted decision in uh, 2012 to uh, eliminate it in the process of, uh, of budget cuts. Uh, and with the elimination of, uh, of PFRA, uh, we, uh, we no longer have uh, a central federal focus on water related issues. Uh, part of the responsibility is with environment and climate change, Part of the responsibility is with NRCAN, with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, uh, with uh, the Department of Public Safety, with the uh, Department of Western Economic uh, Diversification, Fisheries and Oceans uh, has, uh, has a role to play. Infrastructure has a role to play. Uh, there's a lot of very good talent and expertise there, uh, but there's no central uh, focus to pull it all together. Similarly, in the absence of PL, uh, provincial governments have developed a range of different agencies to to fill the gap that used to be uh, that used to be filled by PFRA. Uh, there are uh, uh, private sector organizations among the farm organizations, the watershed associations, uh, and and so forth. Uh, uh, and obviously, John, a, a huge amount of uh, expertise has developed uh, in the academic community. Uh, the, uh, the Global Water Futures Organization represents a, a good portion of that. Uh, and there are uh, other agencies like the Prairie Adaptation Research Collaborative and others uh, that, uh, that do excellent work uh, in developing our knowledge and our brain power. So there's a lot of talent, there's a lot of expertise, uh, but there is no coherent national game plan uh, and quarterback. And I think to answer your question, that's what's missing. A, a place, a focus to draw all of these threads together in a coherent, efficient, intelligent manner. Uh, and that's why uh, we put the commitment uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the last platform, it was in the last throne speech, it's in the mandate letters to, to federal cabinet ministers to pick up what used to be the legacy and the mandate of PFRA, uh, obviously modernize it because it's not 1935 anymore. Um, we're, uh, we're in a, a new and perhaps even a more challenging era with climate change uh, to, uh, to, to build on that expertise for the future, to pull all of these threads together and to make sure we have the capacity based on sound science and sound engineering to answer the important questions and to get things done, not just have a conversation. This is not a gab fest. This is intended to get practical results for people in the best possible management of our precious water resources. Thank you. And uh, I, I think we saw from the science this morning that there are some uh, 
uh, really challenging, difficult issues out there uh, that, that need solutions. And, the, uh, and, and so it's sort of wondering, as a Canada Water Agency, let's say it started up and it has agriculture in its focal point, uh, amongst other things in the, uh, in the water uh, constellation for Canada, and what, what might it get involved in, in with respect to concept and design? Uh, where are the water stresses, the big water problems in the country that you've seen that uh, a water agency might be able to bring together uh, national solutions to help address? Well, there are several, uh, and they vary from region to region and from place to place uh, uh, across the country. Uh, here, here on the prairies, finding the way to flood-proof and drought-proof a larger portion of the grain belt uh, would be a very desirable objective. That's, that was the concept behind the, the building of Gardner Dam, the creation of Diefenbaker Lake. It wasn't supposed to end there with irrigation uh, being developed in the areas immediately adjacent to the lake. Uh, the idea was to do that, but also to convey the water uh, to other more far-flung places across the grain belt uh, and to, to bring the benefits of irrigation and value-added agriculture uh, to, uh, to a larger and larger portion of, uh, of Western Canada. Uh, so there is now a proposal to to build those canals. Now, maybe one going west and north toward Rosetown, uh, another going south and east toward the Capel Valley. Uh, there may be others, but those would be two very large infrastructure projects uh, that, could, uh, that could convey the benefits of value-added agriculture across a bigger and bigger portion of, uh, of Western Canada, perhaps adding as much as 4% uh, to the GDP. Uh, and doing that, as we come out of COVID and the economic lockdown, the economic investment, uh, the job creation, uh, the, uh, the expansion of, of the prairie economy uh, in a very long-term way would be, would be one of the projects. There are also issues uh, in the Suris Valley uh, that have international implications because the Suris crosses from Saskatchewan into North Dakota and then comes back uh, into, uh, into Manitoba. Those issues could benefit from the work of a, of a Canada Water Agency. Uh, the, uh, the flooding in some places along the Okanagan Valley and in the city of Kelowna uh, could benefit from, from the work of the agency. In Ontario, uh, we've seen in, in the last several years with the flooding around the Ottawa River Valley and flooding into the St. Lawrence that's damaged places like uh, Ottawa, Gatineau, uh, the suburbs of Montreal, um, having the expertise of a water agency to to assist with the with the knowledge, the science, and the engineering uh, could be very useful there. Protecting the shoreline of the Great Lakes uh, is uh, is another uh, big issue in in central Canada and along the St. Lawrence Valley. Um, protecting the water quality of uh, Lake Winnipeg, for example, with the algae growth, and that's beginning to be an issue in relation to Lake Diefenbaker too. Uh, finding the ways to delay those polluted uh, 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 drainage systems uh, into, uh, into our freshwater lakes to, to try to protect the quality of the lake. Uh, there, are, there are many issues like that uh, uh, across the country. So it's, it's a multifaceted set of challenges. Uh, and and the, the water agency, again, based on sound science, based on sound engineering, and a practical approach to solving problems and getting things done, uh, I think it would be a, a useful addition to our machinery of government across this country. That's great. It's a, it's a long list, but a, uh, a very urgent list. And I think we'll, we'll hear more about that uh, this afternoon, uh, as well as uh, from what we dealt with uh, this morning. And the, uh, the one thing I, I would bring into that is our groundwater systems, uh, intimately tied into our agricultural water management, yeah. and of course also providing drinking water uh, for uh, First Nations, for producers, for the small communities, and even some of the larger cities uh, in uh, farm country. So, uh, yeah, and we still have we still have boil water orders in too many communities across this country. Uh, we should resolve that issue. A water agency could help with that. Uh, could also help accelerate uh, the whole process of flood mapping. Uh, so wherever in the country, if you get a, 
a downpour that dumps a year's worth of precipitation in 48 hours, where is that water going to go and what is it, go is it going to do and who's in jeopardy and who's not? Having that knowledge uh, perfected for the whole country would be extremely important too. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Uh, in Global Water Futures, there's software is being produced to help with flood mapping. And the question is always, okay, uh, what's the agency that, that applies that software? And uh, mm -hmm. well, uh, so maybe the last question, it's 2020 and the, uh, the UN has uh, started to put together uh, through UNESCO a vision for 2030 for a sustainable world. And uh, but zooming into Canada, in 10 years, uh, what's your vision for how Canada manages its water nationally? Uh, who are the players involved, the capabilities? And uh, how do we do that? And how do we relate to the, our partner in North America in water management, which is the United States, which, with which we share uh, many of our heavily populated river basins? Well, uh, forecasting the future is always a dangerous proposition. Uh, but I would hope, uh, John, within the next year or so, that we would be successful in getting uh, the concept of a Canada Water Agency off the drawing board and, uh, and into uh, the implementation phase, picking up on all of those values and uh, uh, successes that uh, the PFRA accumulated over 70 or 75 years of its uh, existence. It was respected around the world, the Army Corps of Engineers, called upon them from time to time. So did the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. Um, I would hope we could recreate that entity with a national mandate, not just a regional one uh, going, going forward, uh, that would provide us with uh, a smart, coordinated, collaborative approach uh, to uh, dealing with, with water issues in Canada to be, once again, the very best in the world. Um, we need to reestablish re in, in, our, in our work uh, the preeminence of science uh, and sound engineering, uh, basing uh, the management decisions and the practical investments that we make, both in the big engineered projects and in the uh, protection of, of uh, uh, habitat and, and, and watersheds uh, and, uh, and wetlands. Uh, having a, a very uh, intelligent science-based approach to, uh, to all of this, making that science readily available to, uh, to Canadians to, uh, to know and understand. Uh, and I think, I hope that uh, we would uh, have 10 years from now a very clear understanding about how critical water is as one of the central pillars of our pursuit for uh, prosperity, uh, for food security, uh, for uh, uh, sensible action, practical ant action to, to combat the, uh, uh, the implications of climate change, to, to drought proof and flood proof uh, as much of our food production areas as we, as we possibly can. Um, I, I would hope that all of that would come together over the next decade so that we could look back on uh, the 2020s uh, as uh, an era of great uh, progress great common sense in relation to how we respect and use and develop our precious water resources, which will be increasingly important for um, our country and for the planet in the next, uh, in the next decade. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, uh, wonderful that you share your views. And I agree with you, Canada has a proud tradition of putting science first uh, and figuring out how to do things properly before the crisis hits rather than responding to the crisis. And uh, we don't always get there, but we often get there. And it'd be wonderful if we can do that now. So thank you so much, Mr. Bidou. Thank you, John. It makes a lot more sense to do the development beforehand rather than just cleaning up the mess after the fact. Yeah. Great. Brandy, thank, you, sir. thank you so much. That's a, a great, big, huge, ambitious goal. Um, and I would like to call on our policy panelists now to continue this conversation. Uh, hopefully, uh, Mr. Goodale's thoughts have uh, started some, some thinking for you on how your 
your work uh, in, in programming and in, in local and regional work with your partners um, and how, uh, how it fits with the work that you do and, and help us transition to uh, implementing some of these ideas uh, in a way that makes sense for people working on the ground and in organizations and agencies and institutions who really do the hard work of managing um, and making decisions about our water resources. Uh, so we have six experts, all with different backgrounds. Um, I'll introduce everybody here at once and you can feel free to um, turn on your, your video um, and join the, the panel across the top. And, um, and, and Dr. John Pomeroy will be the, continue to be the facilitator of, of this session and uh, he will then launch into the next discussion. So uh, Dr. Don Martin Hill. Don is an associate professor in the anthropology department at McMaster University, and she's one of the original founders of the Indigenous Studies program there at McMaster. Colleen Sklar is the executive director of the Winnipeg Metropolitan Region, where she works with local leaders across Manitoba in building opportunities for collaboration on land use planning, infrastructure investment, economic development, water management and protection. Tom Busalama is a chief science scientist, the chief scientist, apologies, with the International Plant Nutrition Institute Canada. He provides support for nutrient stewardship programs for the fertilizer industry and has 25 years of experience in soil science and agronomy. Dr. Pascal Bado is a research scientist with Ducks Unlimited Canada's Institute for Wetland and Waterfowl Research. He, his work focuses on multiple stressors such as, such as droughts, eutrophication, non-indigenous species and pesticides and how they interact uh, with the ability of wetlands to enhance water quality and regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Alex Ostrup is the chair of Alberta Irrigation Districts Association. And he's on the board of the St. Mary's River Irrigation District, which is the largest irrigation district in Canada. He's an irrigation farmer and specializes in crops uh, such as dry beans, alfalfa and hemp, and grains. Gabrielle Ferguson is the Director of Leadership Programs at the Rural Ontario Institute. He develops and leads these programs and promotes greater capacity for positive dialogue about agriculture, food, and rural issues. Thank you so much everybody for joining us today and uh, for sharing your experiences uh, in your areas and in your regions in Canada and beyond. So I'll pass it over to John to start the conversation. Okay, thank you. And uh, what a wonderful panel. This is, uh, is going to be a great afternoon. So uh, a number of topics that we could discuss and we could probably go for days um, on the various water topics, but we'll try to keep it a little bit uh, focused. And, uh, and also recall that uh, a lot of this is to, to inform the Government of Canada's consultation. It's not our consultation, it's the Government of Canada's consultation on questions uh, uh, such as uh, what are the pressing freshwater challenges nationally, what are the essential ag-related science data policy program gaps, uh, what role does the Canada Water Agency uh, could play in filling these gaps, uh, what are the uh, role of the uh, Canada Water Agency to, to enhance uh, collaboration, coordination between federal, provincial, territorial governments. And, uh, and then also how does the uh, uh, government of Canada's commitment to advancing reconciliation with indigenous peoples uh, uh, tie into the Canada Water Agency. So keeping those in mind as we go through this, um, I thought I'd just sort of uh, run through and start with uh, Dr. Dawn Martin Hill. And uh, uh, Dawn, it's something to ask you, the, uh, what, what are some of the unique water issues facing indigenous peoples in Canada, and in particular, those indigenous uh, peoples that are living downstream or in agricultural areas, and so uh, very much influenced by agricultural water management and development. Yes, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, John. Um, so the issues historically around Six Nations, the Grand River, uh, obviously has been dealing with being um, kind of the holding tank for all things coming down the river uh, from farming and from um, uh, industry. And the community um, hasn't had the resources. Most First Nations have not had resources 
to address these issues. And Global Water Futures gave us an opportunity and access to uh, a transdisciplinary research team made up of engineers and health professionals and governance um, to look at the overall uh, impact. So I think particularly in, in the South where you're surrounded by millions of people, the ultimate colonial context can't be ignored, um, particularly with governance, not having the right uh, access to our, our resources, uh, including water. So I was really happy to hear that water is uh, a high priority um, with Canada and, and the challenge is gonna be how we um, address these historical inequities, which actually aren't historical, they're like current today. Um, and, and how we uh, catch up, if you will, with our neighbors who have had access to infrastructure development, decision-making, um, they've had access to things that First Nations were denied. Um, and, and Six Nations historically, as Haudenosaunee people, were agriculturalists. That, that's what we've done for thousands of years. Um, one of the projects the youth did is they built gardens uh, using traditional seeds and traditional um, um, ways of knowing, which is circular, not in linear, uh, planting and, and certain plants help each other. Um, so you don't need any um, pesticides. So the community is very much concerned about food security, um, like they are in the north in Alberta, like they are in BC. The, the challenge I think moving forward um, is going to be, I agree, science, I'm a scientist, um, is really important. But if you look at globally from the UN and the, the, the climate change panel, you know, you had uh, over a hundred scientists worldwide looking at um, the ecosystem health, water health, um, it, none of them particularly um, informed by indigenous issues. But what they did find, um, which is factual, is that where indigenous people controlled, not had access, but actually controlled their lands and their waters, they were doing exponentially better than those that were neighboring. So the proof is uh, already out there that where indigenous people manage, control their water, it tends to be healthier, cleaner, and, and Irrigation is something indigenous people showed Europeans. I mean, we brought those technologies originally to um, uh, the settlers who were looking at, at how to manage and harvest the land. If we could ever get back to that same respectful um, dialogue where our knowledge, history will show you, it's not a claim, it's factual, um, we were sophisticated in our engineering, we were sophisticated in our irrigation and in our seeds and in our planting and in fact helped create produce that fed the world at a time the world was dealing with starvation. So acknowledging the contributions Indigenous people have made not only to Canada or to North America but globally on how we managed our resources intelligently um, it's not a, it's not a, it's not poetry, you know, like these are things that were accumulated over thousands of years, perfected, and we shared that bounty with, with um, uh, settler populations. Um, then things turned with diseases and, and, and so on. So what we need to do is get back to that original understanding that what we're bringing to the table is not um, inferior knowledge to that of science. Uh, we have indigenous science. We just, it was illegal for 150 years and, 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 and now we're able to come back to the table. So what we need is, is, is uh, uh, to be at the table in a real um, equitable way to be given resources um, and, and to be given decision-making authorities over our own lands and, and resources. And I think if Canada did that and if Canadians, I think, pretty much support it. Um, I think that you would find we, we would do an excellent job. And I'll leave you with one example. Um, here at Six Nations, if you look at our community, even though we're urban, um, we're still doing a lot of agricultural activities, 
um, if you look at Six Nations from a satellite, you'll see the Carolinian forest is still intact. And we had a group of professors come here like, I don't know, maybe 12 years ago, 15 years ago. And they asked our chiefs, um, uh, do you wanna um, have us help you manage this ancient Carolinian forest? And, and, and that's the thinking we need to change. That's reconciliation is how about we go push the reset button and, and maybe allow us to lead you back to where we would like to see all humans treat their environment. We know food security is important. I think now farming communities know, you know we, we support uh, food production, but maybe we have things to offer. The problem is we don't have the voice at the table. We don't have the resources to do the research. Um, and, and we have the will. So I think that the authority could maybe really truly let us engage in a way that is respectful of indigenous ways of knowing. Um, and maybe we could also offer some contributions to the, to the management of waters, particularly of concern of all First Nations that I've heard is they don't talk about water rights. They talk about water responsibilities. And that's the fundamental difference in our way of thinking is it's a responsibility to take care of the water. Um, and I think we just maybe need a new paradigm to, to frame water issues. They also said groundwater is far more important because if the groundwater disappears, all the plant life dies. So they don't particularly look at source waters as being the be all end all, but it starts with what you rely on to drink. So I think we have some priority priorities that might be, you know, useful to other people in the country. So yeah. governance is a big issue. <laughs> thank well, you. Well, thank you. And uh, I, I should say that one of the critical moments uh, of transformation within Global Water Futures was when Six Nations, through your efforts, co-hosted our first annual meeting um, on the Six Nations territory. And we learned so much and started to change our views of all the scientists across the country. And so it's uh, the sharing that went on there is something we're very grateful for. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to move west a little bit now uh, to uh, Colleen Sklar, uh, who's with the Winnipeg Metropolitan Region, uh, but has been working with uh, uh, from Winnipeg outwards uh, to a large range of uh, Treaty One uh, First Nations as well as rural communities and I and doing something innovative in that region for dealing with the water as a whole and as a joint community and so uh, Colleen I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the work in the Winnipeg metropolitan region of southern Manitoba how you brought people together how people came together around water and how are you making decisions about this and uh, then further would you see a Canada Water Agency has been able to enhance uh, coordination and cooperation in the style that you've managed to pioneer in Southern Manitoba. Sure. Well, well, thank you very much, John, and I'm really pleased to be here today. And um, I really enjoyed the morning's panel and hearing um, everyone talk about uh, the importance of a of agriculture, the importance of water, and how they're they're interrelated and, and linked. And uh, it was a really great conversation. And um, I think it's in a really timely conversation right now, talking about a Canada Water Agency. Um, and the creation of a collaborating and coordinating body uh, for one of our most valuable resources. And I don't think it's ever been as urgent. And I mean, we've got to just watch the news to realize how urgent this actually is. Um, when we talk about the role of a water agency, when we talk about the role of a water agency, we have to ensure that there's an understanding about the critical role. Well, you know, that we all have our own struggles. <laughs> sorry, municipalities and indigenous governments play in managing water on the land. And, and literally it's in their hands every single day, that water that's on the land. Provincial and federal governments are often the funders of projects um, that are carried out at the local level. And it's at the local level that these projects are planned, approved, engineered and executed. And it's at this local level where wastewater is managed, drains are, are planned, they're permitted, New housing developments are made often on agricultural lands and wetlands are protected or not protected. It's also at the local level where surface and groundwater 
along with recharge zones, as we talked about today, and as you mentioned uh, uh, just a short uh, a few minutes ago, and they're either managed or they're mismanaged at this level. And it's also the level where agricultural drainage, including tile drains, um, and the drain retain and irrigate, irrigate strategies that we're going to have to have a lot more of, um, really will be taking place and will be planned at that local level. It's also the level where the productive capacity of the land is either enhanced and engineered to protect our communities from extreme weather, extreme weather events and for food security. So it's really here at that local level that there's a disconnect between what happens at that level and what happens at the federal, provincial, and perhaps at the Canadian Water Agency level. Um, so we really have to understand and know how these levels support each other and what really gets implemented on the ground and how that will be, be enabled at higher levels of government and with this agency. So recognizing the important role that water plays and that water municipal governments um, uh, local level governments have, um, we've been working here at the metro region on a uh, uh, this to, to really um, close the disconnect or close the gap between policy and action. And we believe that the way to achieve this is through creating a long term regional plan. And this regional plan will allow us to kind of strengthen those last mile connections and ensure that strategies towards agriculture, climate, land use, infrastructure, um, towards um, you know uh, different um, aspects that ultimately affect water are really embedded into the thinking and are acted on in a way that follows best practice and all of the great science that's coming out across all levels across Canada and the globe. We also believe that strengthening the last mile calls us to work across jurisdictions to build relationships to build capacity to share our data to share management practices and to save dollars. And once we start to save dollars by, by working jurisdictionally across jurisdictions and working regionally, what happens then is we can actually promote new ways of doing business and we can also promote new technologies that we all would like to see implemented. So over the past few years, um, the mayors and Reeves um, um, of the Winnipeg Metropolitan Region, through the leadership of the Center for Indigenous Environmental Resources, uh, in particular Marilyn Fair and Michael Miltenberger, have really taken the chiefs and the mayors through a process of reconciliation. And as uh, Don talked about, they had to get to know each other. They had to have a respectful communication to start with. And so these leaders um, started to work together, recognizing that the status quo was no longer working for them. And they came together, um, the 12 chiefs, 16 mayors, and they began to find a way to work across jurisdictions on important issues. And the important issues when you talk to them are issues of flooding, drought, changing climate, there's new economic realities, new and social issues that they have to address together at that local level. Although they're two distinct levels of government, they often have a lot of the same issues that they're dealing with. So what they wanted to do is find a way where they could start to share and figure out solutions together. Um, last March, the leaders signed an MOU, which was really historic and 150 years um, they got together in a venue at Lower Fort Gary where Treaty 1 was signed and uh, recommitted to work together in a new respectful and collaborative way to start to address issues. And really, when you started to look at the things they were concerned about, they all reflected back to, to water, which is really one of the fundamental issues that, that we're all dealing with. And so currently what we're doing right now, uh, the, the Collaborative Leadership Initiative, is we're working on pilot projects, uh, several pilot projects across the, the, across the landscape, across the region, and in, including the territories um, where the Indigenous uh, governments are located. And we're looking at um, projects that could really contribute to a water quality trading initiative, where we could start to think about how do we manage um, our lands and, and use best management practices, and then how can we find some new ways forward, some new mechanisms to support further projects on the land here. And so um, I really believe that we talk about the Canada Water Agency, I believe it could be very effective in coordinating and convening. It could be an entity that could really help deal with water security and climate. It could also lend support to initiatives like the ones I described. It could lend that kind of uh, collaborative support, uh, support to getting people together. Um, I think that a, a Canada Water Agency could really needs to support local capacity. It has to support the projects 
It can't, it has to support things that we know work through traditional knowledge, through, through um, you know, the local context, having it uh, under, a real understanding of it. And it could really change the way we manage our water on the land. I think it could support real collaborations with indigenous governments. It has to do that. And it can ensure that, and it can ensure work that's being done is implemented in a way that is effective. I really believe, uh, just my last comment is a Canada Water Agency has to support local level go governance and action. You cannot underestimate the importance of municipalities and local level governance, because that is where the rubber hits the road. That is the level of governance where we projects actually get turned out and they need to be done in a better, more effective way. Well, thank you so much. And uh, clearly the combination of top down and bottom up are the way to solve these uh, really difficult uh, problems and uh, wonderful to hear the progress you're making in Southern Manitoba. I'd like to move on now to Dr. Tom Fulsema with the International Plant Nutrition Institute and sort of move it over to the, uh, the realm of the farmers and producers across Canada and, and what are some of the pressing water challenges for them and then how might a Canada Water Agency actually help producers in some way that uh, isn't occurring right now. You know, we have uh, tremendous programs from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and provincial agencies and others and industry. And uh, so uh, what, what can, uh, what are the big problems for producers with respect to water? And then how might the Canada Water Agency uh, find, help find solutions for these problems and get them implemented? Well, John, thank you for the invitation to participate today. It's, uh, it's quite a privilege to speak to you. I'm speaking to you here from uh, Guelph, Ontario. My own background, I grew up on a farm just a few miles across the river from the, from the Six Nations. Uh, having said that, you know, I, um, I have to acknowledge that I have a lot to learn about what went on on the, what goes on on the other side of, the, of that river and, and what, a, what, what I could learn uh, from alternative production uh, scenarios. I've been involved for the last 25 years in supporting both uh, Canadian and US and even worldwide, the, the fertilizer industries programs and nutrient stewardship. And uh, so in a, you know, if you ask me, well, okay, what are the biggest issues? Well, I've certainly been immersed in Lake Erie for the last 10 years or so. Uh, Lake Erie and phosphorus is certainly a big thing and it's not just Lake Erie. Uh, nutrient challenges have been increasing uh, continent-wide here and, and, and so keeping uh, the quality of water that the public expects uh, is I'd say our number one water quality challenge in agriculture. Uh, there, there's certainly lots to do with quantity but I, don't, I won't address that, that's not really in my area of expertise. Um, it, we, we recognize that uh, agriculture cycles a large amount of nutrients. And if you look at the past trends in Canada over the past five, six decades, we have dramatically increased the, the total cycle of nitrogen and phosphorus that we're harvesting from the land each year. And commensurately, we have been increasing the inputs of phosphorus and nitrogen as well. Uh, we are basically holding course uh, on, on nutrient use efficiency in the last uh, decade or two, but recognize as well, there is, that's an average. So there are spots that are getting too much and there are spots that are getting too little in the way of nutrients. And also recognizing that there's a legacy over some of the further past decades, uh, the inputs exceeded uh, what we were removing uh, by a much larger fraction than they do today. So we realize we have issues to manage. One of the biggest things that we have been working with is collaborative certification programs in the industry. Over the past 25 years or so, uh, one of the things that has grown is the Certified Crop Advisor Program, where those who work in industry uh, selling fertilizers to farmers are, re are you know, uh, can, uh, can pass a voluntary program with knowledge standards for management of nutrients, management of crops, soils, and pests, and uh, we have over 1,800 of them working across Canada. They impact a large number of farmers and, and acres. More recently, we've started uh, what is called a certification program in 4R Nutrient Stewardship. 4R Nutrient Stewardship was introduced about 10 years ago as an educational program focused on 
getting the right source of nutrients applied at the right rate at the right time and in the right place. And we now have a program with, with standards and in, in Ontario, even though it was introduced only in the last year or two, uh, we already have 16 ag retail locations certified uh, and they impact uh, the, the nutrient management practices on 43,000 acres, 11% of the Lake Erie watershed in Ontario. So that, that's, there's some uh, pretty substantial programs. Uh, where, where do we feel um, a Canada Water Agency uh, can contribute and help support? What we run into with these programs is we'd like to require our crop advisors, our ag retailers to know a whole lot more than they actually do. In fact, we'd like them to know more than, than I do because uh, there's a lot we don't know in terms of how effective the best management practices that we recommend are in achieving the water quality targets that have been set. We need evidence-based risk tools. We have tools that we require them to know. The trouble is if someone asks, how much difference does it make if I place my phosphorus under the surface of the soil rather than broadcast it on the top, I can tell you, well, this is what I recommend, but I can't really tell you how much difference it will make to Lake St. Clair, to Lake Erie, to uh, Lake uh, Winnipeg, or, or the many other reservoirs that are affected. And so I think there is an, a role for the Canada Water Agency to support multidisciplinary collaborative research that produces what I, re and what I really like that uh, Mr. Goodale emphasized, practical solutions practical solutions in terms of tools that we can communicate to the public linking agriculture's impact to water quality not just the horror stories but also where we're making progress and uh, that, that's i think uh, very important and a very uh, big opportunity for the canada water agency to address uh, we need more long-term tracking of nutrient loads in rivers and communications back back to sources. I've had the opportunity to work on both sides of the uh, Canada-US border, and I can tell you that uh, there is, of course, uh, just physiographically a stronger link between agriculture and Lake Erie there. Their drainage is much, far more direct into Lake Erie than Canada's is, uh, but they also have developed programs that communicate what's happening in the rivers. They have a forecast of the harmful algal bloom. Can we develop products like that and how much will that help us understand the impact of our actions on uh, the, the quality of water going in, into the lake? Um, the one recommendation I would make for the Canada Water Agency, I've, I've read a little bit about the, di the discussion paper and how it's intended to be set up. There's a lot of emphasis on engaging with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and I believe that's very, very important. But we also need to recognize that across Canada, each province has a university or two that's very strong in agriculture. And agriculture and water are strongly intertwined. We, we really need to have that linkage recognized in a water agency as well, and linkage, of course, to the provincial agriculture departments, which still have a strong role in uh, extension and uh, ensuring that recommendations are science-based. I think I'll leave it there with my comments for, for this point, to this point, John, and uh, okay. thanks. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It, uh, and, and, uh, and it's uh, absolutely uh, crucial when you look at optimizing that nutrient cycling, uh, that we, uh, we put it into plant growth and, and less into the water, and that's, that's a, a certainly a good role for Canada Water Agency, and and uh, and also to look at these things in a cumulative effects framework. Um, the next uh, question is for Dr. Pascal Gadio for with Ducks Unlimited Canada, and um, Pascal, you're uh, very aware there's there's much science monitoring partnership activity across Canada. Uh, how might the Canada Water Agency pull all this together? to ensure that we're, we're picking up on the information, the science we need, detecting the trends uh, that can help mitigate water quality and quantity issues before it becomes too late. This is really following up on, on the call that, uh, uh, that Tom brought up uh, in his comments there. 
Yeah, well, thank you very much for the question, John. I want to start off by thanking Global Water Futures, uh, John and Stephanie, for, for giving Ducks Limited Canada the chance to, to participate in this panel. And I think it's really important to continue these conversations in these challenging and unprecedented times. So, so thank you for that. Um, so to the question, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, a Canada Water Agency could, could play an absolutely vital role in refocusing how we actually do some of the monitoring at the national scale. So again, Canada being, uh, you know, a vast country with, you know, tremendous water resources, I think we do a, a pretty good job at monitoring uh, large lakes, large streams, large rivers, but alluding to some of the conversations that, that and, and topics that Helen and Marin spoke spoke about earlier, once you start seeing changes in large rivers and lakes, it's almost too late. And so this really kind of goes to the gap that was formed in the absence of the PFRA. And so can the Canada Water Agency help uh, refocus some of those efforts, you know, at the farm scale, focusing on on small. Um, ephemeral streams and creeks that are embedded in the agricultural landscapes as well as wetlands. And I think that's important um, because those, those are the proverbial canary in the coal mines. Those, those are where we're going to see the immediate impacts of changes in agriculture as it responds to climate change and the implications for water quality and quantity uh, as it responds to climate change. And so I think coordinating those efforts is really important. Now I know that type of monitoring program is often quite daunting uh, when you think of it uh, through a federal program or even a provincial program. But maybe one of the primary um, things that a water agency could do is to actually coordinate the expertise that already exists on the landscape. So you have multiple organizations, whether it's Ducks Unlimited Canada, the Lake Winnipeg Foundation, Alice Canada, Nature Conservancy of Canada, all who are dealing with thousands of projects uh, throughout agricultural regions and, and, and working and coordinating with private landowners who could, who could potentially help implement some of this program but would need that coordinating uh, role to be undertaken by something like the Water Agency of Canada. So I think developing those partnerships and strengthening those and, and building those synergies uh, would be vitally important. And then the, the last thing I'll highlight here is, and this is, this is kind of the current buzzwords that you hear all over the place when you're developing proposals, is around green infrastructure and nature-based solutions. And those have been, they've been rolled out to different extents in different jurisdictions. So you have certain jurisdictions who are really running with those and other jurisdictions that, that aren't paying attention to them. And so there might be a role for a water agency to develop codes of practice and help, help um, help communicate that knowledge and transfer that knowledge to jurisdictions and, and, and perhaps even help target some of that programming uh, across agricultural regions in Canada. So thanks and I'll, I'll leave my comments there. Okay, well, thank you very much. And your comments remind me how PFRA uh, brought together Environment Canada and the Three Prairie Provinces and, and Ducks Unlimited and the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture Committee uh, to look at uh, uh, drainages in eastern Saskatchewan, how they might be modeled, and the uh, without that convening role, it's uh, much more difficult to do that sort of collaborative work. Um, I'd like to keep going further west and uh, to uh, talk to Mr. Alex Ostrup with the Alberta Irrigation Districts Association. Alex, I, I mentioned a little bit about the changing uh, river flows that uh, are predicted for later in the century. Uh, uh, sometimes more water, but certainly earlier water uh, coming through the uh, the old man, the bow, and the other major irrigation districts. And um, but that's that's one particular forecast, and um, and there could be others. The um, we're wondering what's missing to support producers. There's so many other issues around irrigation, um, uh, including uptake and the economics and the social systems around it, and the marketing. And uh, I'm wondering what's missing to support producers and their water needs and decision making. And I wonder if you can speak to experiences with uh, successful PFRA and other federal roles in water management that Canada Water Agency might want to consider as it moves forward. Thank you, John, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to participate in this forum. Um, I farm in southern Alberta. I'm an irrigation farmer, and I have no doubt that uh, climate change will impact what we do greatly. 
And as so uh, confidently pointed out by your panel this morning, it's not just the impact of average temperature changes and precipitation and so forth, but especially the extreme weather events and the timing of those. Um, and that is something that we're already dealing with and will continue to deal with on an even greater level going forward. Uh, from a farmer perspective, what that means to me is that I'm either dealing with too much water or too little water. And uh, the irrigation infrastructure in place here plays a mitigative and management role for both of those scenarios. And I just want to preface that by saying the infrastructure, uh, the infrastructure here would not be possible had it not been for the involvement of the PFRA. And I want to echo Minister uh, Goodale's comments that uh, certainly out west here, we see that as having been a very successful program in bringing together both provincial, local uh, producers and federal uh, efforts and funding in order to build this infrastructure. So when it comes to dealing with too much water, um, the infrastructure plays a significant role. We've seen flood events in, mo in recent years, overland flooding in particular um, uh, in, in southern Alberta, and the infra uh, irrigation infrastructure was used to help mitigate those flood effects by opening up that infrastructure for water conveyance and helping get uh, some of that water moving from areas that were being impacted by it. Uh, as a result, and in conjunction with uh, provincial environment uh, agencies, we've um, negotiated and executed several agreements with uh, uh, municipalities and with counties uh, for water conveyance and dealing with drainage and dealing with flood mitigation. And certainly um, federal government involvement and uh, assistance with those efforts uh, is, is definitely um, appreciated and would be, would be of great benefit. Uh, if there's too little water, obviously irrigation uh, infrastructure plays a role insofar as it's able to not just provide water to municipalities and rural communities, uh, but also, of course, to put water onto the fields to make agriculture possible out here in the West. And uh, that, uh, that infrastructure has allowed uh, an increase of diversity in agriculture and certainly an increase uh, in the efficiency of the acres that are irrigated here. Um, and how we effectively manage a situation where we have too little water uh, really comes down to, to two things. One is to improve the efficiency of the water that we do use. And the second one is to improve the ability to capture and store water. And that second one goes back to your point earlier of these flows coming at inopportune times and in uh, greater quantities and more sort of bunched up. So we want to have the opportunity to capture that water. Um, perhaps in May to use in July or whatever the case may be. But going back to uh, improving efficiencies, I think we've done a good job here on a local level of improving the efficiency of the water we do use. Uh, from the period of 2005 to 15, 2015, uh, we've improved uh, irrigation efficiency by 46% in Alberta. And that is um, that consists of 26% less water use. So we're using 26% less of our allocation during that period uh, than we were at the beginning of that period and, um, and also putting more acres under irrigation. And that has been largely achieved through increases of technology, uh, improved technology, um, having low pressure uh, pivots as opposed to sprinkler systems, putting more into uh, pipeline as opposed to open ditches and so forth. So we've really had a, a big efficiency uh, drive here uh, in, in Alberta with respect to use, making more uh, doing more with the water that we have available. The second component, the ability to improve um, our ability to capture and store water, uh, that is something where historically uh, we've had uh, great uh, government support through the PFRA. And as Minister Goodell mentioned, uh, unfortunately the federal support of that uh, has gone by the wayside. There's certainly something we'd like to see come back. It's a good investment for all of Canada. Um, a University of Alberta study in 2017 showed that the, um, the benefits of, uh, of uh, in, um, investing in this sector uh, to a degree of 83% benefit uh, all Canadians and 17% and the producers. So uh, it is of benefit to all of Canada. And if we look at uh, the direct contributions of that infrastructure to the federal government, um, every year from 2000 to 2010, the contribution directly to the federal government by way of transfer payments and taxes and so forth adds up to $825 million a year, all at a time where uh, there was no direct federal 
um, investment in that in that program. So uh, we're doing what we can on a local level to um, help, um, I guess, improve the capacity utilization of our existing reservoirs. Uh, for instance, our largest um, pumping station, which is an off-flow uh, uh, reservoir uh, servicing and, and topping up the main canal. We've uh, improved the pumping capacity and, um, um, and power it through a net zero system uh, so it's completely solar powered. So we're using, uh, our, we're improving our existing capacity, um, but also we need to uh, build new capacity in order to, to um, store water when we can. And that becomes ever more important as the flow of these waters becomes less predictable and more impacted by uh, severe weather events. So that is certainly where we'd love to see um, some coordination on the federal level with uh, provincial investment as well. Um, and uh, then lastly, um, in addition to the infrastructure investment where we see the Canada Water Agency playing a large role, uh, I just want to follow up on uh, Dr. Badio's comments that certainly from a quality perspective, we'd love to see more coordination done uh, when it comes to water quality testing. Uh, we have a program within the irrigation districts uh, where we do approximately 300 tests a year. It's completely funded by the farmers themselves to monitor quality throughout our infrastructure. Um, but that is something where we'd love to see more coordination. And we also would like to see more data collection. So the, the Water Survey of Canada uh, has played an important role throughout to be able to monitor and collect data and analyze data. And we'd love to see an enhancement of uh, the role that they play and more coordination among the various um, uh, stakeholders that participate in that. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Uh, there's, there's lots to digest there. Uh, there's clearly lots of need, lots of opportunity. And we've seen with the recent uh, water disaster on the Milk River, uh, what happens when we lose uh, infrastructure, uh, such as the uh, collapse of the canal this, this year. And, uh, yeah, and that was, uh, sorry to, to jump in there, that, so that was in, in Montana. And yes. it, is a, it is an absolute uh, perfect example of uh, the role that government has played uh, in uh, north of the border versus south of the border, so far as that uh, uh, we do have uh, infrastructure that it has been maintained through government support, and we're certainly grateful for that. And when that government, when that coordination between the levels of government and the farmers and the irrigation districts is not there, uh, then uh, scenarios like that can can happen as we see uh, in Montana. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, next, then, our, our final speaker, I'd like to uh, call up Gabrielle Ferguson with the Rural Ontario Institute. And in, in this case, I'd like to move away from visioning the Canada Water Agency to thinking about how might it implement uh, critical components that we need to better manage our waters for agriculture and waters from agriculture. And uh, we're running a bit behind, so uh, uh, Gabriel, your uh, concise and impactful comments would be appreciated. Thank you. No problem. I can do that. And uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I'm certainly pleased to be here actually from two, from two standpoints. One, uh, I'm a farmer in the Lake Erie Basin, and so this topic is certainly of importance to me. And then, uh, second, pleased to be here on behalf of the Rural Ontario Institute. And, I want to bring some of the experience that we've had there dealing with a lot of complex issues around you know, transportation and health services across rural communities to maybe to lay some of that experience on the table when it comes to a Canadian Water Agency. And it's about creating a common language uh, within which the agency is able to operate. Um, there is some opportunities, I think, in five areas uh, to to allow um, some collaboration there and creating a common language for everyone. And the first one I think is about creating um, uh, reliability of a shared resource. And the reason that we need to do that is because there are many, many people doing a tremendous amount of things across our nation, but we have limited resources for them to do that and unless we share those resources in a way in which each of them can access it instead of reinventing the wheel we're going to run 
out of money and time and people to do everything we need to do across Canada. Um, and so things like continuity in year-round monitoring, uh, interdisciplinary uh, data as it comes in, or I'm actually watching the chat line at the same time and I'm seeing a lot of these comments come up at the same time. So creating a warehouse where this data can go and you be able to use that warehouse reliably as an area that we can synthesize the data and maybe even build some consensus statements out of the census that's done there would be helpful. And the second point would be to create protocols for data collection. What it does is it allows us to validate information. And we could even use the methodology that's been used by the engineering community. And what they do there is they grade types of data. And it allows us to be respectful of the types of data that came in. And then we can go back to some of the comments that Don made originally about some of the historical data that we're not capturing at this time. And that data is created the whole way from repeatable scientific methodology to one of a kind storytelling observations. And it, it pays tribute to the history and the things that are happening presently. And it allows us to collect to the change that's happening. Um, and again, the third thing I would say is access to place-based data. So what is happening is that we have tremendous things happening in watersheds across the province. They have to do with quantity and they have to do with quality. But what's happening is in order to substantiate that data, in order to take the data that's being collected with scientific methodology and use it in a way that we can forecast through models, we need to be able to validate it with concrete place-based data. And that means a place to warehouse that. It means LIDAR imagery and aerial imagery that can be connected across, across our province, across each province and across the nation. And so this self-reporting piece is the ground truth in all of that, that needs to get into that place-based data so that we can have models we can count on. Uh, the fourth thing, and it goes back exactly to some of the comments that uh, Tom made, I think, about what's in it for me. You know, what's in it for me? How do I make a difference? How do we assess the impact? If we want people to collaborate and we want them to take actions on the ground, which is certainly what Mr. Goodale is, is shout out for us, and I agree with it 100%, they need to know how they can make a difference. And the way to do that, again, is being able to collect all of these pieces of the puzzle and have a warehouse for them so people know how they can make a difference and they're motivated to do that. And the last piece that I would make is we need a revolution in our reward system. And we need a revolution. Why? Because you need to reward what you want to receive. And you need to meet people where they're at along that continuum. So researchers that must publish means they need unique data and they need a new question each time. How about changing that reward system so that they incrementally are able to contribute to a system that grows and grows year by year to measure the impact that's happening? And we can answer that question about how do I make a difference? And we allow them to be rewarded for the extension pieces that they do. Those extension pieces are what's going to help us get action on the ground. They're what takes science to policy, and that should be rewarded. The reward system also needs to go to the landowner, the farmer that's in the system. If they're going to make a difference, where are those niche markets? Where's the premiums? How can they go from sort of a finger pointing sort of system to a reward system that allows them to say, look at what I did. Look at the difference I'm making. This is the impact that I'm having. And the same thing with industry. Many of the industry are doing it because they're personally involved. It's making a difference. We know that the past president of Mosaic, the largest phosphorus producer in Canada, lives on Peely Island. He cares about algae. That's why he was driving for our nutrient stewardship. Allow these people to meet us where they're at and reward them, and it gives stability the whole way through. Those are my points. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate Thank the opportunity. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. And uh, it's, uh, we, we've had a fantastic discussion from panelists and 
I'll give them a virtual applause as best we can do in Zoom. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Stephanie and uh, we'll keep it moving along here. Thanks so much. I always love ending on a call for a revolution. Yeah. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> okay, so um, we're about 15 minutes behind, but everybody has such great content. It's so hard to, to jump in there, uh, especially with the Zoom, uh, with the inability to kind of jump in. But um, uh, so we would like to extend the session by 15 minutes and completely appreciate it if anybody can't stay, but please consider staying for uh, an extra few minutes so that we can get a quality breakout in the breakouts were so much work that I want to make sure that we can actually do it. <laughs> That's my ulterior motive. Um, so just a few little uh, kind of guidance pieces as we move into breakouts. Um, so I have already assigned everybody two breakouts to 21 rooms. So there's about nine to 10 people in each of the breakout rooms. So that works out perfectly. Um, each room will be hosted by a Global Water Futures researcher or a young professional. Uh, who've signed up to help us out. Uh, the host will help keep the conversation going um, and encourage everybody to participate. I have given each of those hosts a list of questions that can be used to guide the discussion. The questions are adapted from the Government of Canada's Place Speak portal, which is their uh, online engagement system for asking for feedback on the Canada Water Agency. We thought uh, by using those questions as a guide, we would kind of collect and receive information that could be used uh, to create a report that could be directly submitted to uh, their engagement process. So um, that's the framework for discussion. So uh, that's one. We will have uh, further of these as we uh, develop them over the uh, summer and fall. And the idea is to provide uh, uh, advice through the white paper and other means uh, from the partnership, which includes Global Water Futures, but many other groups, uh, CIER and FLOW and, uh, and uh, uh, Massey College and the Fobian Foundation, UN University, others, and to, uh, to get that uh, to our, our uh, colleagues at Environment Canada and other government agencies that are uh, pulling all of this together. And uh, so I'd like to thank uh, everyone who's worked on this and uh, pulled it together. And a big thanks uh, for Stephanie and for Nancy uh, for keeping this running smoothly along with hundreds of people and uh, more moving parts than any human eye could track. So I, I thought you did a superb job and thank you very much.